Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this discussion on the Bank of England on the occasion of the publication of a book by Harold James on making of a modern central bank. We've got an exciting three hours of conversations ahead of us, three panels and loads of speakers that were at the center of the action at the time, as well as key watchers of the Bank of England. On the one hand, it may sound like we have a lot of time ahead of us, but it could also be enough just to scratch the surface of the conversations one can have about the Bank of England at that time. Before we do so, some, uh, some words of context to, to set the scene on my side. This conversation in the book is the latest in a series where OMFIF has explored the UK's monetary history. Some of you were with us when we launched a few years ago the book by the late Dick Roberts uh, on when Britain went bust on the 1976 a uh, sterling crisis that forced the UK to go to the IMF, and more recently also the Six Days in September book by David Marsh, Bill Keegan, and also Dick Roberts again uh, on the 1992 ERM crisis. But as in previous occasions, and so today as well, we are not going down history lane just for the sake of it. There are important lessons for today in studying this period of history of the Bank of England and the UK, uh, around questions of independence, transparency, accountability of central banks, all very relevant to central bankers uh, in the current juncture. And Harold's book analyzes the 1970s as a macrofinancial uh, experience on monetarism, on how it worked in the UK, on how things were tried and what worked, what didn't work. It's an important text with lessons for today in that it goes into how policymakers are reacting when an intellectual framework is seen as not to deliver or to fail. One may say why banks, especially in advance, have not met their inflation targets. Um, and so it's an important guide in how changing frameworks uh, over and over again, both in response to intellectual changes and prompting, but also to changing macrofinancial conditions. So we've got also an excellent audience with us today from all over the world and from all types of the financial system, uh, banks, asset managers, central banks as well. Uh, thank you all for taking the time to join us today, as well as our colleagues from the Bank of England and the Treasury itself, the NIESR and all those who contributed to making this event happen. Thank you very much. And please uh, do participate by the panel, ask your questions, and uh, we'll look forward to engaging you in this. I also should note that the book has received considerable attention, not just from the UK, again, showing that it's um, something that has lessons for central banks globally. So there, there's been reviews about its application, for example, in the context of African central banking and institutional setup. And the book is also being translated into Polish, uh, the EU's sixth biggest uh, economy and also the largest economy that is not in the euro area. So I'll hand over to Harold now to take us to his keynote presentation on the book. Thank you very much. Well, th thank you so much, uh, Danai. Um, th thank you, David. Thank you, uh, Omfif. Um, and uh, thank the very, very distinguished panel that's assembled here to uh, think about the history of the Bank of England. Um, this is a book uh, that deals with a fundamental a transformation, a modernization of uh, central banking um, in reaction to a series of big shocks. In the 1970s, uh, the UK was in many ways quite dysfunctional um, and the bank was also lacking in orientation. Indeed, I think it's interesting, and particularly since we have such a international uh, audience and uh, international panel here uh, to think about the comparisons. The Federal Reserve um, statute from 1913 sets out very clearly what the aims of the Fed should be. The Bundesbank statute set that out. The ECB charter uh, sets that out. Uh, but the Bank of England didn't have any of that kind of guidance. You look at the legislation and it doesn't tell you anything about what the purposes of the Bank of England uh, were or what they should be. And it's only really in 1998 with the, with the uh, quite radical reform of the Bank of England, uh, that the legislation specifies quite clearly uh, what the Bank of England should do in terms of price stability. Um, in the 1970s and 1980s, many people were still thinking in terms of a 
macroeconomic executive in which the bank and the treasury uh, were part of an approach to, uh, to public policy. Um, this is the story of that transformation. Um, in the early period at the beginning, uh, it's an operation that proceeds mostly by verbal processes um, in writing. Um, th there are these very extensive memoranda um, and uh, it's, it's a written culture. In the 1980s, um, it switched uh, to being much more about uh, oral communication. Uh, and the two figures, the leading young figures who were billed as future governors of the Bank of England, um, Eddie, Eddie George and David Walker, uh, were both superb communicators in terms of being able to push a discussion in a certain direction. Uh, people talked about Eddie George as having a silver tongue and David Walker uh, was called Walker the Talker, what known as Walker the Talker. Um, but in the 1990s, that changes again because the bank is addressing a wider audience. Um, and there, the language of the bank really changes to the provision of data, to the provision of statistics. If you look at the fan charts on inflation in the 1990s and the inflation report that was an innovation in the 1990s, um, they don't look substantially different uh, from the fan charts that are produced in today's radical uncertain environment. I, I wanted to think about three kinds of shock that uh, affected the, the bank um, and affected the UK as a whole. Um, one is to do with how globalization works. Uh, globalization is also a story, not just of capital flowing and goods flowing and people flowing, but of ideas flowing and of models of institutions flowing. And um, foreign central bankers uh, play a really much larger role in this history than they did, I think, in any uh, previous history. And in particular, uh, two figures, uh, Karl Otto Pearl, the president of the Bundesbank in the 1980s, um, and Alan Greenspan, uh, in the 80s and 90s uh, play a really outstanding role, um, in part um, because of the way that the political leadership responded to those foreign bankers. Uh, Mrs. Thatcher uh, thought of Karl Otto Pearl as the model central banker, uh, told the governor of the Bank of England, Robin Lee Pemberton, when he was in the Delors Committee, preparing the Delors report on the monetary union uh, that Lee Pemberton could sign up to anything that um, Karl Otto Pearl would agree to. So he was taken as the, as the, as the guideline. Um, and then in the absolutely crucial decision to enter the exchange rate mechanism of the European monetary system in 1990, uh, in October, 1990, where the prime minister, Mrs. Thatcher was very hesitant. Um, the way that the bank and the treasury managed to push Mrs. Thatcher in order to agree to this um, was to get Alan Greenspan to give her a phone call uh, and to tell her that the EMS was fundamentally a new version of the 19th century gold standard. The 19th century gold standard imposed discipline. Uh, Mrs. Thatcher should like that kind of monetary discipline. Um, and, and Greenspan also played a really quite central role in the 1990s in discussing uh, not just with the government, but also with opposition figures, uh, with uh, George, George uh, with um, uh, Gordon Brown and uh, Ed, Ed Balls, I think is on the call and is going to uh, talk later um, about how uh, uh, an autonomous, uh, operationally independent uh, central bank uh, could function. Um, a second theme, uh, that I wanted to think about and briefly flag at the beginning is that uh, this is a period in which there are two really severe recessions in the early 80s and in the early 90s and both of those recast the framework uh, for thinking about policy. Um, the period in the early 1990s, it's only really a very short period uh, from uh, October 1990 to September 1992, uh, when the UK is in the uh, 
uh, exchange rate uh, mechanism um, is, is really, I, I think, uh, quite, quite crucial in terms of anchoring expectations. Uh, the discussion, if you think later that inflation targeting is the answer to the problem, um, that's right, I think. Uh, but it, it's very hard to think about introducing that in a period when expectations are radically unanchored. And uh, when the pound went into the ERM, it went in um, at an exchange rate that may have been wrongly chosen, but also with a high, very high rate of inflation. Um, and it takes time to take that down. And it's only when that external anchoring has been done that I think the possibility of providing an internal anchor, it becomes much more plausible. It's a case that Alan Budd set out uh, very dramatically um, in the uh, later 1990s. Um, but the, that brief episode between 1990 and 1992 also did something different in terms of changing the view of how the British financial system should operate. That's the theme of the third panel. Uh, that David has uh, arranged uh, the, and his colleagues have, have arranged this morning, or this afternoon in uh, the UK. Um, at the beginning, at the beginning of this history and through the 1980s, the UK's financial system is very segmented and very specialized. Uh, there are all kinds of financial actors that have very, very detailed uh, roles. Um, and uh, you can think of it as a system uh, that is in part regulated and supervised by itself. It's self-supervised. Uh, these independent actors are keeping an eye on each other. Uh, the uh, 1990 um, entry into the ERM uh, was also characterized by an episode uh, that shed some light on the informal meetings that took place, uh, the meetings of the discount market uh, with, with the bank uh, and pushed to a much more formal role then in which uh, instead of having informal contacts and a segmented financial system looking at itself and regulating itself, uh, you needed a completely different framework of regulation. Um, there's a lot in the book uh, on that. Uh, obviously in the period itself, people focused on the failures, on Johnson Matthey, on BCCI, uh, on bearings in the middle of the 1990s. Um, I think it's important also to put alongside that the successes. And one of the things about this, this kind of uh, story is that you can tell uh, 30 years later, a kind of story that couldn't be told at the time, because the rescue of a big clearing bank, for instance, in the early 1990s, which is an important part of the story, wasn't widely known um, and couldn't really be boasted of because of the implications of that rescue uh, for the credibility of the bank and the successor institution. So uh, it's moving to a new world. It looks as if it's a uh, more stable world. It looks as if it's successful. Um, uh, financial stability, which was put as one of the uh, goals of the bank in a discussion of objectives and uh, the, the way in which the bank thought of itself in the early 1990s um, is taken out in 1997 and in the legislation in 98. Um, and uh, it looks as if you can get a world in which financial stability obtains because of good monetary policy. That was the kind of ideal world that started to look as if it was being realized in the uh, early 2000s. Um, but there are obviously problems with that. And one of the problems is that if financial actors uh, think that there's so much stability, they may be pushed, tempted uh, to take on better, uh, bigger um, risks and those bigger risks uh, maybe destabilizing. It's a story that ends in the, this book before uh, 2008, but it's impossible to write the history as if 2008 didn't happen. And one of the odd things I think that is happening, and this touches on what, what uh, Dana was mentioning about the way in which this has a kind of current implication, is that some of the debates that look as if they were settled then have come up again. And in particular, the connection between monetary and fiscal policy, which was really separated, the macroeconomic executive was broken up deliberately in the later 1990s, uh, is 
coming together again because monetary policy after 2008 and particularly after the COVID crisis, much more so uh, has fiscal consequences and uh, there's a fiscal monetary regime. And so it's difficult just to comment on one bit of that, uh, that uh, regime. Um, financial stability uh, is clearly after 2008, um, uh, a part of the framework. And so financial stability, financial supervision comes back to central banks, whether it's the uh, Fed or the ECB, but it's also uh, true of the Bank of England in 2013. And even industrial policy that looked as if it was a kind of relic of uh, a previous age um, is coming back in the aftermath of the COVID crisis. Because when you think about the need to restructure for an economy and a society that is going to look quite different, um, then it's difficult to operate uh, with the simple mandate, uh, the narrowly focused mandate uh, on price stability. And uh, you get back uh, to a world in which the central bank is looking as if it has to multitask. Um, you might think multitasking is a cool thing to do. Uh, many people have to multitask uh, today, uh, but it also raises aspects, questions about governance, um, about how the accountability works uh, in a world that looks in some ways as if we're moving back in time, uh, back to the 1970s. So it's, I think, timely uh, to think about these lessons in the midst of another enormous economic, financial, social and political shock. Uh, thank you, thank you. And uh, now I am going to pass over the uh, discussion to uh, David, uh, David Marsh, who is, I think, moderating the first panel. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Harold. I think you've now set the scene for your, your, new, your new book, it, it Is Multitasking Cool? So it, in a way, you have turned full circle because as you've explained, the modern central bank, when you finished the period, did seem to be a narrow central bank. But now, uh, beyond 2003, a modern central bank does look indeed quite wide. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, a certain number of these issues in the first panel. If I could just introduce the panelists in the order that they'll be speaking. It'll be, first of all, uh, Lord uh, Mervyn King, who was well known as governor of the Bank of England in 2003, 2013, i.e. after the book finished, but of course played a very big role in the 1990s. And Lord Lamont, uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, 1990 to 1993, a seminal moment. We then have Ottmar Issing, old friend of Mervyn, old, old friend of everybody, uh, who was the Bundesbank chief economist in the seminal days of 1992. They went on to become the first chief economist of the European Central Bank and watched all this from Frankfurt over that whole period of time. Uh, welcome, Barry Eichengreen, professor from Berkeley in California. I had to get up quite early today. Good morning, Barry. Thank you for coming and giving us an international dimension. And then Charles Goodhart, whose story runs like a red thread through the whole of this uh, whole scene. Uh, you were chief advisor at the Bank of England in the 1980s. You were also one of the first members of the Independent Monetary Policy Committee set up in 1997 as a result of the reforms then. And of course, you've been watching all of this from the London School of Economics latterly as an emeritus professor. If I can start with you, Mervyn, please. Uh, the three things I want to get out of this panel is one, this overall march to modernity, uh, and the, the story that Harold has set out so brilliantly in his book. The uh, second th thought is the catharsis of 1992. In a way, you must have quite welcomed that because it did allow the bank to get on with the business of inflation targeting. And you did meet Ottmar, of course, on that seminal moment on the 14th of September 1992, when you went to the Bundesbank with Alan Budd to try to show that the, the sterling exchange rate was a reasonable one. And then 1997, uh, the granting of operational independence, did that set the scene for some triumph, so also for some failures, because uh, it seems as though the bank did rather take its eyes off the ball uh, for part of that era, and you weren't all that interested in the financial stability wing. Um, so, uh, Mervyn, first of all, when you got to the bank in 1990, were you aware that this really was uh, uh, an institution that needed shaking up and with the monetary policy function needing to be put back into the center? Well, David, thank you. In your characteristic fashion, you try and turn it into a rather dramatic uh, question. So 
I want to go back to Harold's book. Um, Harold's book covers the period 1979 to 2003. And that's the period I'm going to be talking about. That was a period which was one of a dramatic transformation in UK macroeconomic policy making. We went from high and volatile inflation to a period of remarkable and indeed unsustainable stability. And the bank itself changed from an institution based on mystique to one based on a high degree of transparency. So let me, as you suggest, talk about a few key turning points in that that journey to what Harold describes as making a modern central bank. I think one of the successes of the book is to show how difficult policy making was in the 1980s. There were dramatic changes in the degree of competition in the economy and especially in the financial system with the abolition of foreign exchange controls and the abolition of many quantitative restrictions. But these microeconomic changes made life extraordinarily difficult for policymakers trying to control inflation. Interpretation of the money supply figures became almost impossible. And as a result, policy was probably too tight in the early 1980s and too loose in the late 1980s, by which time policy was then focused on the exchange rate. And of course, Britain joined the exchange rate mechanism at a time when Germany itself needed a stronger exchange rate or higher interest rates to deal with the challenge of German unification. So with the benefit of hindsight, and I stress it is hindsight, it might well have been better for policy in, in the early 1980s to have focused on the exchange rate, and in the late 1980s to have focused on domestic monetary indicators, the reverse of what actually happened. In any event, whether or not ERM membership was necessary to force us to go through a deep recession to bring inflation down. I don't entirely buy that, that argument, Harold. I think one of the things that's striking looking back at the 1980s is how politicians at the time were willing to take extremely unpopular decisions in order to achieve changes in the economy. But for whatever reason, membership of the ERM, ERM did come to a shuddering halt in September 1992. Now, the book naturally focuses on the events of 16th of September, 1992. But I don't think we should forget that before that, Sweden and Finland had to abandon fixed exchange rate pegs. Uh, Sweden having tried to put interest rates up to 500%, a remarkable figure, and clearly one that politically was unsustainable. And that after September, 1992, in 1993, the rest of the ERM itself pretty well disintegrated when the bands were widened so much that the constraint meant rather little. And the big lesson from that period was that fixed exchange rate pegs were extremely vulnerable to speculation when shocks altered the underlying equilibrium exchange rate. And so the choice in effect was between floating rates with a domestic monetary policy framework or a move to monetary union. Now, I don't believe that the UK was ever really close to joining a monetary union because of the political implications of sharing fiscal policy. And I think it's fair to say that that journey onwards through monetary union was the point at which the UK and the rest of Europe were moving on diverging paths. It's also explained why you yourself became somewhat uh, disillusioned, by, uh, as Harold puts it, by any form of entanglement with the continent. It, it, monetary union was the point at which it became clear that we were moving along different paths. But nevertheless, one thing that's worth stressing is that that period between 92 and 99, when the rest of Europe was moving towards monetary union, and we were developing our domestic monetary framework, was one that saw actually a very close relationship between the Bank of England and first of all, the Bundesbank and later the ECB. So I'm delighted that Otmar Singh is on the panel today. We met frequently, we exchanged views and became firm friends. And we wrote papers on the lessons that our central bank could learn from the other. Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, Mervyn, but just very briefly yeah. before I go on to Norman Lamont, could you just say a few words about 1997? Uh, uh, as I said, the, the 
it did set the the bank on this path towards operational independence. It did give you a financial stability remit, but it seems as though a few passes went astray uh, in the late 1990s and the 2000s. Were you aware that that might lead to problems because there may be a, a point where monetary stability wasn't everything and one had to look after financial stability as well? So I think that the logical outcome of the path on which we had embarked after 1992 was independence. The book explains very clearly the events that eventually led to independence of the central bank. And I think that was a logical conclusion. The Monetary Policy Committee in those early years was very clearly aware of the unsustainability of the path, not just of the UK economy, but of the global economy. And Harold refers to the debate on the MPC, where eventually Eddie George settled it by saying that two speed growth is better than no growth. And there was some controversy about that because there was no doubt that the UK was allowing an unsustainable expansion of domestic demand to occur in order to compensate for weak external demand. That could not continue. And it wasn't something that could easily be managed just by monetary policy. Eddie himself said to me, that the reason he felt he had to do that was that in the very early years of an independent central bank, it would not be possible to bring about a sharp slowdown in the economy in order to rebalance the domestic economy. We had to keep going. And hence, two-speed growth is better than no growth. Good. Well, thank you for making that point very clear. Could I now go on to Norman Lamont, uh, please? And Norman, um, those three questions that I put, um, how would you answer those, please? Those, those three big issues. Well, I think I'll skip on the first to modernity. I don't really have much to contribute to that, except that I think any idea that the bank was sort of hopelessly amateurish um, in, in the 70s and 60s, I think would be, be wrong. It was a different world, but I think people like Gordon Richardson um, and uh, the governor when I was chancellor were very well in touch and very, very professional. Can I just come on to the impact of 1992? I was interested that Mervyn just now made the point um, that it wasn't just that Britain left the ERM as it's often described, it actually was the breakup of the system. And Mervyn referred to the fact, I think he mentioned Sweden and other Scandinavian countries that devalued before us, not just the Scandinavian countries, it was also Italy as well, eight countries devalued all broadly at the same time, although obviously we were one of the most important, we were the most important. What are the effects of um, the events? Well, huge political consequences, but one in particular, which I think Mervyn was hinting at, was I think the departure from the ERM helped, helped to turn British public opinion against European Monetary Union. I always remember at the Bath Ecofin, there was a demonstration outside. And when we came out for the group photograph, there was a man holding a poster, which had the words ERM, Extending Recession Mechanism. And that, I don't know correct, but that was actually how a lot of British people saw it. I remember when William Hague became leader of the Conservative Party, he apologized for Britain having been in the ERM and said that the ERM was really a dry run for monetary union, but the difference was like the difference between being inside a burning house and being able to get out in the ERM, whereas monetary union would be locked permanently in the burning house. Of course, not everybody who was in favor of the ERM, like Nigel Lawson, for example, favored monetary union, although people often confuse the two. What were the economic benefits and this draw? We all know what the drawbacks were, of the ERM. Well, I was interested that Mervyn said, if you look at the determination of the government in the 80s to get inflation down, he didn't buy the argument that without the ERM, we wouldn't have had the discipline and the necessary interest rates in order to get inflation down as decisively as we did within the period of the ERM. I rather disagree with Mervyn on that point. Maybe it's a difference of time, a difference of the personalities who were in government. But I think as Stephen Wall, who's quoted by Harold James in his book, said, we would not, that government would not have had the willpower to lower inflation in quite the way that the ERM did. It was a dramatic disinflation, which gave us a competitive advantage that lasted for a very long time. Moving on to the 
third uh, point about the new framework. Well, obviously, we had to find, as Mervyn put it, uh, a new anchor. Independence for the bank was out of the question, unfortunately. I twice raised it with uh, John Major, but he, for various reasons, did not want to go down the path of independence. We had been looking at and following very closely inflation targeting even before um, September 1992. Um, and I had had meetings with uh, Ruth Richardson and uh, Douglas as well. Um, if there's one point I disagree with slightly in Harold's book, it is, I think the impression is slightly given too much in the development of inflation targeting from the point of view of the Bank of England as though it originated in the Bank of England. I don't think that is quite uh, correct. And really, uh, Mervyn played a key part in persuading the bank and helping us develop. But the groundwork was really done by Terry Burns, Alan Budd and, uh, Mark, and, and Turnbull, Andrew Turnbull. And we had to do the development of the new framework very, very rapidly. Um, I had to go to the interim committee in the IMF days after September the 16th. We had the Conservative Party conference in October. I remember we were in hotel bedrooms trying to develop the, the whole framework of the inflation target, how it be defined, the monthly meetings, the quarterly uh, reports. Uh, and that was all put together in a very, very uh, short period of time. I would have liked to have added independence to it because I thought the arguments had become even more compelling. Why did I think that? Because I had watched both under Mrs. Thatcher and John Major the political interference with interest rate decisions that uh, prime ministers you know, under huge pressure were often inclined to make. Even Mrs. Thatcher did do that. And I felt that independence, which was spreading throughout the globe and was very much uh, what was happening in Europe, was something that we ought to uh, follow. As I Just say, a final I, point, uh, Norman, on that, sorry to interrupt, but was it inevitable that it would be a left to centre government that would give the Bank of England this operational independence? That's often been the case in, in history. Well, I think it was the example of what was happening in the Eurozone. And, you know, during the Maastricht uh, negotiations, we were very conscious of other European central banks and how they were, I think all this influenced people's opinion. I did uh, actually go and see Tony Blair and Gordon Brown myself to persuade them that they ought to commit the Labour Party to make the bank uh, in, in, in independent. Did you go in disguise, Norman? No, I didn't go in this, guys. I went quite uh, openly. But I remember when I put my arguments, and one of the points I said to Tony Blair was, it's not my job in any way. I don't want the Labour Party to prosper. But I, it does seem to me, incidentally, it would help your credentials a lot. But I believe this is what the country needs. And Tony Blair said to me, well, I don't think you understand the Labour Party. They would never accept it. Anyway, they did accept it. And I think it has uh, worked out well. But I think Today, there are other questions to be answered. I think the distinction between fiscal and monetary policy, as Harold has said, has become somewhat blurred. And I'm worried that central banks are now overreaching themselves or being asked to do too much. Should banks really be involved so much in the green agenda, issuing green gilts? I have my doubts about this. But we'll we'll get onto that, I'm sure, if, if time yeah. allows. Thank you very much, Norman. May, may I go on now to Otmar Ising, who is an old comrade in arms of both you and Mervyn. I think, uh, Otmar, you met Mervyn King for the first time on the 14th of September uh, 1992, a rather stormy day. What, what are the big issues that stand out uh, for you, uh, Otmar Ising, in, the, in this whole uh, cavalcade of events, this roller coaster of different episodes? David, first, thank you for having invited me to this fascinating dialogue and co-correlation to Harold on his great book. Um, this Monday in September will never um, be missed in my memory. It was a remarkable day. And by the way, to start with the end, uh, it ended with Mervyn and me becoming good friends, like in Casablanca, for the beginning of a wonderful friendship. <laughs> this is the personal side. Uh, on this Monday, I regret it. These two young, excellent economists coming from over the channel uh, to defend an undefendable case. And uh, I was reminded uh, in this moment that 
from a moral perspective, um, the exchange rate system of fixed but adjustable packs from a moral standard is seen as uh, something which should not be taken because it forces uh, central bankers and politicians to lie in case they are asked just before a devaluation uh, if this would happen. So they have to lie. So there are uh, high moral people with high moral, moral standards who uh, defy such a system for moral reasons. But uh, as uh, Merving has already indicated, the ERM had two functions. On the one hand, it was creating a system of adjustable pegs, uh, uh, <clears throat> which could not, could not last. It survived because of the wide uh, extension of the band in, in 93. But on the other hand, from the beginning, the EMS already was seen uh, by Giscard d'Estaing and um, Helmut Schmidt is the cradle, so to say, the core of a future multi-union. And this ambition would uh, divide uh, the Bank of England, uh, the Bundesbank. And I think the, I learned from uh, Harold's book to what extent the Bundesbank and its president uh, were, so to say, leading. I know from the French how they were felt humiliated by the dominance of the DM. In the relation between UK and Germany or Bank of England and uh, Bundesbank, it was more a partnership. Uh, but the British uh, strategy, uh, or I should rather say uh, Margaret Setzer's strategy, uh, to put all on the rock, Karl or the Pearl, to withstand any move in, in the direction of Monte Union, in 1995, at the occasion of the annual meeting of the IMF and World Bank in Madrid, in a long bilateral uh, discussion, he told me, uh, Carlo, to always charming, but no fighter. Uh, I think he realized that uh, he was aware that uh, the decision to give up the DMARC, for which he had not much sympathy, was a decision to be taken by government and parliament. Uh, so he <clears throat> took put all his efforts uh, in the Bundesbank too to guarantee um, statute for the future European Central Bank to make the Euro a stable currency. So there was not more resistance to this move towards multi-union, but to guarantee that uh, the new future European cur common currency would be a stable one. Just a, a final point, very quickly, uh, to, for you, Osmar. Was it inevitable, do you think, that once the path towards monetary union got underway after Black Wednesday, that Britain would therefore cease any kind of uh, entanglement uh, with Europe? Was the uh, that time in September, was that the beginning of Brexit? From, from hindsight, <laughs> from, from hindsight, I, I think Mervyn has mentioned, uh, I think there are so many issues they are mainly political issues separating uh, the UK position uh, from, let's say, the German, the German one. I think this was um, there are trigger for concrete actions, uh, but I think basically uh, the two countries uh, follow different uh, paths when it comes to uh, in the sovereignty of uh, the country. In Germany, we have this disaster of uh, Hitler regime and uh, the end of Second World War. So uh, German attitude is very marked uh, by this situation, this defeat in moral and military uh, dimension, in all dimensions, whereas uh, the UK at least felt uh, to be the, uh, on, on the victory side. No, well, thank you. Um, may I go over to Barry Eichery now, all the way to California, um, taking up what Harold said about a modern central bank maybe being a multi-tasking central bank. Um, how well do you think the Bank of England is now in its structure, uh, having got there through this uh, tangled series of episodes? How, how uh, fit for purpose is the Bank of England at this moment now, would you say, Barry Eichery? I'll get there in a minute, David. I want to start actually with the question that you posed to me uh, last week. Uh, can I think of any other central bank that's gone through an equal amount of turmoil? Uh, what one 
more politely might call equally rapid modernization in a period of 20 years, uh, my answer would be not if we're talking about an advanced country central bank in the period since 1979. If you let me look at the entire world, I might point to the Central Bank of Argentina or the Central Bank of Brazil, but I kind of suspect those are not the comparators uh, you had in mind when you posed the question. If you let me look over a longer period, I might point to the Federal Reserve in its first 20 years uh, when it discovered open market operations in 1921-22 when it engaged in its policy of direct pressure in 1929, when it grappled with abandonment of the gold standard in 1933, when it was centralized in 1935. But if we limit ourselves to advanced countries post 1979, I, I, I think the Bank of England case is dramatic and, and, and striking. Organizationally, there was the, the rise of professional economists. There was growing attentiveness to open economy aspects of monetary policy and finance. There were uh, changes in the bank's responsibilities for and conception of financial supervision. Operationally, uh, it's especially remarkable to see the succession of uh, sharp changes in monetary policy strategy from monetary targeting to exchange rate targeting to inflation targeting. As we've heard, uh, these were in fact three radically different policy strategies from one another uh, adopted in relatively short order. I see the, the first two as efforts to import or buy policy credibility so as to deal with a chronic inflation problem. Monetary targeting or monetarism was imported from US and Swiss academics. Exchange rate targeting was a way of importing credibility from uh, the Bundesbank uh, the switch to inflation targeting was a switch to, or uh, more properly, recognition that credibility had to be grown at home. And, and that third regime worked remarkably well. My long-term, longtime Berkeley colleague and former Bank of England staffer, Andy Rose, calls inflation targeting an absorbing state. No country that has adopted it has uh, ever abandoned it, so far as I know. One, one might ask whether IT is still successful given uh, that the credibility of central banks 2% uh, inflation target seems to be lacking in the eyes uh, uh, of the markets at the moment. Uh, I myself see inflation targeting as the least worst alternative, uh, the worst alternative except for all the others. And, and, and the reviews that central banks are currently conducting uh, as mere tweaks to uh, the underlying framework. One thing I didn't get clearly from Harold's book is how the bank was able to quickly and smoothly identify this alternative and navigate the transition to infl inflation targeting uh, in a matter of months. Uh, Harold tells us and, and, and Lord Lamont told us that uh, the bank was aware of the New Zealand precedent but plenty of other central banks were aware of the New Zealand pre precedent and they didn't navigate that transition equally well. That's something that I think the, uh, the book could tell us more about and, and, and maybe the, the panel could as well. If I have that, a minute- That is now, a very, uh, th I think you've answered my first question as well, but that is a natural link to our fifth guest, uh, Charles Goodhart. Uh, you could maybe tell us a little bit about that transition Charles, you obviously had quite a bit to do with New Zealand at that time, but tell us a bit about the mood music as well, also with Mrs. Thatcher in the time when you were at the bank actively in the 1980s. Oh, thank you, David. Uh, I do think that Barry exaggerates enormously about modernization. I first went to the bank in 1968, and I last sort of was working at the bank in sort of middle of the 2005 about, and frankly, there wasn't that much change. Uh, what the um, Harold, I think, doesn't get sufficiently, and Barry completely misses, is that procedure determines performance. Now, in the early days before 1997, and particularly before 1992, the bank was subservient in terms of the decision on interest rates to the Chancellor. The Chancellor had his own group of economists with him, and it was perfectly clear that the Chancellor would always 
be much more swayed by the economists who, with whom he was talking than by the economists in the bank. In particular, we in the bank were not even allowed to give our, to publicize our, our forecasts on the grounds that outsiders like journalists, like you were once yourself, David, would only be interested in the difference between the two. So consequently, the bank knew perfectly well that e the economic analysis would not be a lever for influencing the chancellor. Instead, the lever that the bank used was its knowledge and its very close knowledge of how markets worked. We always went into the meetings with the chancellor prepared to use the phrase, ah, yes, Mr. Chancellor, but the markets won't wear that which meant that inevitably the brightest and best uh, in the bank, because that was where the power of the bank lay, went into the, the market area, into the gilt market and the money markets area. Uh, so that uh, it wasn't that we were opaque, it wasn't that we were entirely amateurish, it was that the structure of the way that the political system worked meant that the bank would concentrate on its market analysis rather than its economic analysis. And when the structure changed, as it did in 1997, again, things changed dramatically. I, nowadays, it is the bank forecasts that everybody looks at, and that they don't look anything like so much uh, at the Treasury forecast. So it was not really so much a question of modernizing, it was a question of the structure and role of the bank within the system being changed. Um, one, Just a word about Mrs. Thatcher, perhaps, uh, Charles? Yes, um, I think Harold is much too kind to Mrs. Thatcher. Um, and one thing he does get wrong, that in his Hong Kong chapter, he asks uh, what caused the original upset. And what caused the original upset was Mrs. Thatcher's failed visit with Chairman Dung to try and get the lease on the, um, uh, the Kowloon area extended uh, for another 50 years. When Dung turned her down absolutely flat, uh, everyone began to think, oh, it's coming closer than we thought before. Beyond that, I, Mrs. Satcher was a very strong instinctive monetarist, but it was instinct rather than analysis. In fact, it was my view that she always thought that monetary base control, which she was told was wonderful, uh, was an alternative means of controlling interest rates. And, and she could discuss in, uh, uh, controlling inflation and she could discuss uh, interest rates quite separately from discussing monetary base control and control over the monetary aggregates. She relied enormously on her advisors, Keith Joseph first and then Alan Walters, uh, for the details, she was not a technically qualified monetarist at all. She was an instinctive monetarist. Well, thank you for that summing up. I'd like to go back to all the panelists in the order in which uh, they have spoken for some further thoughts, and I'll throw in some questions from the audience. But first of all, uh, Harold, uh, I think you wanted to say something anyway, but I've also got a question directly at you, uh, Harold, from Mario Pisani at, at uh, the Treasury. And he says, does the panel feel that the role of HMT is underplayed both in 1992 and 1997? And uh, Mario, ask you, uh, Harold, uh, maybe you couldn't have uh, the access to the official records uh, at that time. So, uh, Harold, perhaps you can answer that. And then we'll go back to Mervyn and go through everybody in the order that they've spoken. But first of all, please, Harold. So the uh, story of the 1980s is indeed uh, that the Treasury has the upper hand in these discussions um, and uh, th that uh, the, the bank is a kind of subservient part of that and uh, they, they, it, it can't speak publicly without the uh, drafts having been vetoed by the by the, the treasury. I, I think what's what's striking about 1992, and you know, obviously, I looked at uh, quite a lot of treasury documentation. Um, I mean, probably less in the 1990s than in the 1980s. But on the other hand, uh, the bank always had the copies of uh, treasury memoranda and, and treasury meetings. So I don't think that I got a one-sided view of this. Um, and uh, what happened is that there was an enormous uh, policy vacuum after the 16th of September. Um, and 
the, the, the problem is that, uh, of course, people were thinking about uh, scenarios, alternatives, um, uh, plan Bs, plan Cs, um, uh, and but, but the, the the discussion, for instance, on European Monetary Union, what the the Treasury had really pinned its, itself onto, was a discussion on moving to a different version of monetary union around a hard ecu with a, with a kind of design. Uh, for how, how the future union would operate. And so in, in September 92, there's a, there's, a, there's a really big policy vacuum. And I think the, the story is very clear in the documents that the, the, the bank moves into that vacuum. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's uh, in, in fact, clearly a very personal story because it's, it's not even clear at the beginning that, uh, that Eddie George uh, supports this. So it's very much a, a, a personal initiative of... Um, uh, Lord King, um, and uh, it's 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 brilliantly successful because it it, it has a, a clear plan. And so that's the answer, yeah. actually, also to Barry's question um, uh, about uh, why the New Zealand uh, episode looks so important and so interesting, is because it's the thing that you can demonstrate that it's been successfully applied somewhere else. Um, it looks convincing. It looks coherent, um, and so it's got a kind of policy purchase. Obviously, you do need to. Uh, convince the Treasury of this, and uh, it, it's it's also clearly a good thing uh, that the Treasury uh, were convinced. I had one other comment on the discussion so far about whether the ERM blew up in 92, 93. Uh, well, indeed, uh, there were a series of, of revaluations, um, and one of the problems of the ERM was that there hadn't been revaluations or devaluations or uh, realignments um, in the five years before 92, uh, and uh, it, it, it should have been a general realignment in 92, but it clearly also was vulnerable to, uh, to speculative attacks. And what, what, what the episode did also was to produce a lot of really interesting macro, macroeconomic thinking and modeling of how speculative attacks work. Um, but what's really striking is how the ERM was really rescued um, when everybody else had given up. Uh, by Lord Lamont's successor as Chancellor. Uh, so, um, you know, that's another case of where at a striking moment, a, a really apparently odd plan uh, can be very successful. The widening of the exchange rates um, does indeed allow the ERM to work in the transition phase uh, to the creation of the euro. And if you look about it, it with the, the speculative attacks uh, in July 93 against the French franc. But after a period of instability, the franc Deutschmark rate, the, the central rate of this, ends up at more or less exactly what it was. Before. Yeah, well, that's a very interesting uh, point. And funnily enough, I did actually speak to Ken Clark last night. He can't take part today because he's driving uh, on the way down to London, but he is an unsung hero. Um, could yeah, I just he, go I mean, he really to, to you? Uh, th th that's uh, is very, very important in this episode. It, it, it is. Could I go to you now, Mervyn? Uh, so we, we've only got about uh, another 15 minutes or so left. Um, a, a question from the audience, actually. Uh, can you tell us the benefits of Black or White Wednesday? Because it did set the ball rolling towards floating rates. Uh, and also it did actually cause the other Europeans to get on with a single currency. So the questioner asks, should we not see this as uniformly good thing? And then could I just throw in a question from me at the same time? Uh, we heard from Charles about how the bank was very good at talking about markets, and uh, Eddie George was particularly uh, adept at this. Was there a real difference of opinion between you and Eddie after uh, 1997? Because uh, Eddie uh, clearly thought that the bank has, was having various functions taken away and wanted the idea of the bank to be more than just a monetary policy institute, whereas you rather liked the idea of just being able to concentrate on monetary policy. That was your big idea. So was there a clash of views between you and Eddie in 1997? Please, Mervyn. No, absolutely not. There was no difference at all. On that Monday morning when the bank learned for the first time that we were going to be made independent, and it was real news to us, we had discussed this before the election in 1997 and come to the conclusion correctly, I think, that the only circumstance in which we could be made independent was if it happened immediately. Because otherwise the changes to the Monetary Policy Committee, which had been flagged in the Labour Party manifesto, uh, 
would either have worked, in which case, why change it? Or if it hadn't worked, then we wouldn't have built up sufficient credibility to be made independent. And so it was a big surprise to us that we were made independent in 97. And I sat with Eddie in the bank alone that morning, just the two of us. And he talked about what he saw as the new bank. And he was prepared to make that trade-off. He said, if the prize of independence means that we have to give up debt management or even banking supervision, that is a prize worth having because his entire career had been devoted to trying to ensure that the Bank of England was at the center of ensuring price stability. And he'd seen every attempt and failure of economic policy over the years to bring inflation down. He was absolutely committed to seeing the UK on the path to price stability. But of so course, he didn't know then that uh, supervision would be taken away in, in quite the way that it, it was, because no, there was but, a promise but, of consultation, well, wasn't there? I, I can tell you from my conversation with Eddie that morning, he knew that that was a possibility. And what he had obtained from Gordon Brown was what he thought was a promise to have a period of consultation during which his colleagues in banking supervision could make the case publicly for supervision to stay with the bank. He was not going to take sides on that, but he would allow that debate to take place. He thought he had a promise. And I thought probably he did have a promise at that point. But then the situation changed in that it turned out that the possibility of having two sets of legislation. The, the internet seems to be breaking up slightly here. Can, um, can everybody hear what Mervyn is saying? The, the key point was... Yes, that in, there's a, a slight hiccup here. The in, internet connection is somewhat unstable. Uh, I'm going to turn off my, my video just because... The key point here, David, is that initially Gordon Brown thought he might have two goes at legislation. One, to make the bank independent. And indeed, we operated for over a year on a non-legislative basis, legislation to make the bank independent only took effect in the middle of 1998, even though we operated as a committee for a year. But when the possibility of a second set of legislation in 1998 to change the structure of financial supervision was denied because the cabinet had other priorities for legislation, Gordon Brown realized that he only had one go at this in legislative terms. So he changed his mind about the uh, consultation period and decided he had no choice but to make the decision in principle and implement it in legislation straight away. And it was that that led Eddie to be upset because he felt that he was letting his own colleagues in the bank down. He would made a promise to them and he was having to go back on it. It wasn't his fault, but he felt that having made a promise to his colleagues in the bank in the supervisory area to go back on that was... Uh, something he really didn't want to do. Um, but having thought about it, he then realized that it wasn't any, it wasn't a problem that he had initiated and that his duty was to stay and manage the first few years of an independent Bank of England. And he was absolutely right on that front. Yes, uh, Harold makes clear in the, in the book that the thoughts about resignation were very quickly dismissed. Um, the, the, the point about uh, the question of Black or White Wednesday is something I wanted to ask Norman Lamont about as well. Very few quick comments on that, uh, Mervyn. Well, it was both. It was a shattering defeat of government policy. There's no question about that. Government had gone out on a limb to say we would stick to this parity and do whatever was necessary. So it clearly was a defeat. But as Norman made clear later on, it was also an opportunity to put in place, with inflation having been brought down by the period in ERM, to put in place a domestically oriented monetary framework that could deliver what we all wanted. So that's why I called it a bit later on Grey Wednesday. It was a mixture of both black and white. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, Norman, uh, the whole of this episode reminds me a little of this uh, aphorism, which is sometimes attributed to Winston Churchill, that nations always do the right thing in the end after they've tried every single other alternative. W was it in your mind uh, at the time of 1992 that we would actually be on a good path to a more stable system by relying on our own forces and, and our own willpower rather than hitching a lift 
uh, with the Bundesbank? Was that in your mind at that time? Well, before I answer that, could I reply to the question Mr. Pisani posed, which I don't think you'd allowed anyone to answer, which was, is the role of the Treasury underplayed in Harold's book? And frankly, I think it is. I mean, it's an admirable book, but bits of it reminded me a bit of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. And it's people off stage describing events elsewhere that they're not fully participating in. And I did feel that uh, in the description of September the 16th, it was entirely bank centric and didn't understand what was going on in the treasury. And secondly, as I said, I don't know, great respect. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Mervyn's, but, and Mervyn played a very important role, but inflation targeting did not, as far as the treasury is concerned, originate in the Bank of England. I can categorically state that. And, you know, Harold appeared not to take that point from my original presentation, but you can ask other people and I think they will confirm. Um, black or white Wednesday? Well, as Mervyn said, it was obviously politically a, a huge uh, uh, upset and we paid a very great price for that. But I think, as um, Robin Lee Pemberton uh, once said, uh, actually, it was a tool that disintegrated in our hands after it had served its useful purpose. And so, in a sense, we benefited from being in and we benefited from being from getting out. Yeah. That wasn't how it was designed, but it was actually the consequence of what, what happened. And as I said earlier, I do agree with the view that whatever the political cost of it, we benefited hugely by having this very rapid deflation, which got our inflation below that of Germany for the first time of very many decades. And that was of something that served us very well. Uh, I mean, the chief beneficiary was Gordon Brown rather than Kenneth Clark or myself. Uh, politics is like that. Uh, that. That leads us on to Otmar. We've got about 10 minutes left for remaining questions. Um, we were reminded about one of the thoughts of Robin Lee Pemberton. He once said to me that Britain left the ERM at the right time, Otmar, because the Germans were no longer a pivot of stability. And he said it's, he said it's a bit like when you leave a party after the most uh, attractive uh, young lady leaves, you, you leave the party too. This is what Robin Leigh Pemberty said to me. Were you aware, Otmar, at that time, you had just joined the Bundesbank, that Germany was losing its luster as a pivot of stability? No, not at all. We did everything to defend this position in, within all the turmoil caused by German reunification. Uh, so to... to to guarantee confidence in the stability of the DM, it uh, forced us to raise interest rates. This was, of course, a very bad development for our partners. We were fully aware of that. Uh, but at that time, uh, we were, uh, the Bundesbank law was, was, our mandate was very clear, a domestic one. We were, on the one hand, the leading central bank in, in, in Europe. Uh, but on the other hand, our mandate was uh, to safeguard the stability of the DM. And in the context of German reunification, inflation in, in West Germany, only measured in West Germany, uh, rose above 2%. Two, two this was uh, unacceptable for us. Uh, so um, to defend the credibility, also looking in the future uh, of uh, multi-union, uh, was a key endeavor of our policy. And uh, I think um, with all the turmoils in this context, uh, the credibility and the stability of the DM was not lost. The inflation expectations, long-term interest rates uh, came down in the context of our uh, monetary policy. Well, thank you. Uh, Barry, um, a question from the audience, but you can also use this question to hang any other points that you want to make. Um, the questioner says, from your vantage point, was the new policy that came in after 1992, um, and indeed after 1997, um, homegrown from, from the, your viewpoint that you've been watching all this internationally? Or, uh, and can you put into context the effect of all these foreign conversations. We heard about Alan Greenspan, for example, very important person. I know Theo Weigel, for instance, played a role. Can you put that into an international context, please, Barry Eich and Green? I want to first uh, acknowledge uh, Charles Goodhart's point that 
Americans are, are fundamentally unable to understand Treasury Bank of England relations before 1997, although we have had a rather remarkable episode of, of Treasury Federal Reserve interaction here in the United States in the last week. Um, I, as I said in my remarks, I, I, I regard the post-1992 transition in the UK as, as fundamentally homegrown. I was amused to, <clears throat> to read in, in Harold's book about the role of Alan Greenspan and uh, Carl Brunner and so forth. The other point I would make is, is to reinforce what's been said about the uh, fragility of, uh, of the EMS, that the EMS was fundamentally untenable. Another reason it was untenable is that the strong currency uh, central bank in the system limited its intervention on behalf of uh, the weak currency countries, the Bank of England in 1992. And there's, uh, if you look at the intervention data, which are in, in the Bank of England's archives, there is a striking difference in terms of how much support the Bundesbank provided for the Bank of France, uh, its uh, trusted partner in the EMS in 1993. But only after they put up interest rates, there was a quid pro quo, wasn't there? Indeed. And I don't think Norman would have gone along with that as a, as a prize for getting a swap line. I somehow think uh, that might have... I mean, Norman, I don't know if you want to just comment on that. Um, the, the French did put up interest rates quite severely. That would have been a bridge too far, maybe, for Britain. Well, I, I think you're right. As you say, there was a price for it. But you know, the, the basic problem in the ERM at the time was the contrast between conditions in Germany and conditions in the UK and conditions in many other parts of Europe demanding opposite monetary policies. So the whole problem for us was we we had real interest rates of about 6%, real rates of 6% at this precise moment. Good. A final question for you now, Charles. It befits you to have the last word, a man who is a law unto himself. Uh, Harold has described the journey from a wide central bank to a narrow central bank. We're now back to a, a wide one, it seems, a, a few years after the end of the story that uh, Harold is talking about. Is it inevitable we'll swing back again to uh, a more, another definition of modern central banking, maybe in 10 years, will be again a, a narrow central bank? How do you see that panning out? Fortunately, I don't know what the future is going to bring. All I will say is that we can't foretell the future. It will always bring surprises and that the Bank of England, like other central banks, will have to adjust and adapt as the future changes. And uh, uh, it's better to, to try and write histories about the past, which we know a bit about, rather than try and forecast how the future is going to unfold. It's not going to be like the past. It will change. Well, perhaps I'll put that same question to Mervyn. Then you've got such a splendid library uh, with so many neoclassical statues. You must be able to answer that question, Mervyn. Uh, will we be swinging back to a narrow form of central banking again in 10 years? Well, I think that Norman was right in suggesting that we need to be pretty cautious about believing that central banks are the solution to every problem. And I think one of the concerns I have is that a particular academic model of monetary policy has the implication that any bad news to the economy should result in central bank stimulus and action. And I think this is a serious mistake. There are many reasons why the economy might from time to time grow slowly. Only some of those are amenable to central bank action and central banks should stick to that. Otherwise their independence will come under challenge if they start to spread their net too widely. Well, this might be the, the time to give you, uh, Otmar, the final word, since you're speaking from, David. from Würzburg. Uh, David. Is, is it, is, so, Norman, would you like to, is it an well, I, I just wanted to add a postscript to what Charles said that I've Please, heard, carry on. summed up well once by a president of the Royal Society of Statistics who said, the past has its own uncertainty, although on the whole it's not as great as that of the future. We will bear that one in mind. Uh, Otmar, are you worried about the central banks being driven into a trap? Because Charles has spoken very eloquently about the fact that central banks won't be able to raise interest rates in the future because they'll be too damned unpopular if they did that. The Otmar heading for a trap? Uh, they are in a trap. They have uh, constructed party 
themselves giving in to all the pressure from politics to be responsible for almost anything from green to distribution. And this is undermining independence. So if uh, they can get out from such a trap without major conflict with politics and uh, disturbances in the economy will be a, a tremendous challenge. Good. Well, thank you. On that searching note, um, we've been trying to squeeze a, a court into a paint pot here, but I'd like to thank all my five panellists, uh, uh, Mervyn, Norman, Charles, uh, Barry and Otmar. Thank you very much indeed for taking us through this roller coaster. I'm now going to hand over for our second panel. Please do stay on the line and ask questions or put points if you'd like that. Clive Hallwood, who's the managing editor of OMPFIF, I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you very much indeed for all being on the line and thank you for your questions, audience. Thank you very much indeed, David. Um, and, uh, and what a fantastic discussion we've started with there. Um, if I could just ask our next set of panelists to please uh, switch on their, their mics and their cameras so that we know that they are there, uh, that would be great. Our focus now is going to be on, on, uh, on the part which, uh, which David and his panel nicely teed up, the post-97, and particularly focusing on the thing that Mervyn himself described as being a surprise, the, the, the way that supervision was taken away from the bank um, and, of course, given to the uh, FSA in a new role under HM Treasury. Uh, for this discussion, I am delighted to be joined by four very esteemed panelists. Um, if I was to tell you their entire career histories, that would take me to the end of our panel. So we will focus on what they were doing around the time of the discussion period we're looking at. So joining us at the moment are Patricia Jackson, oh. head of the Financial Industry and Regulatory Division of the Bank of England from 95 to 2004. We have with us Peter Middleton, who was Group Chairman of Barclays Bank from 99 until 2004. Ian Plenderleith, a member of the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank from 97 to 2002, and David Scully, who was a director of the Bank of England from 81 to 98, and also a senior advisor to UBS throughout much of this period. So um, all of you, please uh, welcome to our discussion. Um, let's kick off with that thing that Mervyn was talking about, the surprise of the, um, the removal of supervision from the bank. Um, and also, Harold says in his book, though, that, that in that first 10 years, uh, from 1997 to the financial crisis in 2007, the monetary and financial governance mechanisms set up by the Labour government worked well. Um, I wonder if the panel agree with that assertion. Maybe, as I think Ian has virtually travelled the furthest to be with us this evening, uh, Ian Plendley, maybe you could kick us off with that. Uh, well, I think... Um... There are kind of two halves to the question of um, were the 10 years successful or not. Uh, the first one, uh, the monetary side, uh, looks like a kind of um, uh, non-A question where you expect the answer yes. And I think the answer certainly is yes, uh, for all the reasons that the uh, participants in the earlier session have talked about. Uh, the other half, obviously, is the uh, financial governance mechanism um, which is treated, I think, um, less extensively in the book than, than the monetary side. Uh, and I think it is possible to underestimate, I mean, obviously the, 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 the answer that everybody looks to there is the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the um, crisis that emerged at the end of that 10 years. And therefore, obviously, the, the system, the, the, the structure and the process must have been at fault. But I think there are... Um, positives during that kind of 10 year uh, period, particularly in the development of the concern about financial stability. Um, I think um, one moved in that kind of period from a, um, a sense that um, the bank was alert to react to incidents when they blew up, uh, but very often they came at us um, uh, unexpectedly. And I think we, we reacted reasonably alertly and reasonably intelligently, but it was essentially a kind of reactive approach. Um, in, in my own case, uh, I vividly remember that a number of these kind of incidents tended to blow up about seven o'clock on a Friday evening, just as I was trying to go home. And I got rather fed up with them all coming up then. Um, and, and we moved, I think, to a mindset where we wanted to have a process of scanning the horizon and trying to identify uh, areas of weakness and 
possible cracks or flaws in advance and then trying to look at the system, see if we could uh, preempt them rather than just react to them. Um, now, that obviously didn't go far enough. Uh, there was a major financial crisis that blew up and tore us all apart. But I think nonetheless, a lot of progress was made in uh, moving from a ad hoc um, response to incidents to a more structured process of trying to um, uh, anticipate problems. So whilst the monetary success of those 10 years is undoubted, I don't think the financial um, uh, governance failure is absolutely 100% of that period. Thank you, Ian. Patricia, you were at the bank through much of this period. Could you, could you tell us your thoughts? Yes, I, I, I do think that there was a flaw in the structure. I, I think the independence regarding monetary policy was right. I think setting up a clear financial stability focus was right. I think the difficulty was that the bank wasn't really close enough to what was actually happening in the banks. There was a view that the asset price inflation that you could quite clearly see wasn't um, best dealt with by monetary policy, but the sheer extent of the buildup of risks couldn't really be seen by the bank. It, it didn't appear in the data. You could see the growth, excessive growth in some of the balance sheet. But you couldn't see, for example, that some of the banks were sitting on 70 billion of US RMBS in their treasury operations, which gave them a huge liquidity risk and um, general risk. So I think you've got to look at the role of the bank, but also um, the focus of the FSA. So not only did the bank no longer do banking supervision, but it was moved to an organization that was very focused on conduct risk, behavior, um, um, treating customers fairly, et cetera, rather than prudential. I think prudential was, was a much smaller part of what they were doing. And, and so you had the bank not very close to the data, the, the actual facts of how much risk there was in the system. And you had the FSA really still very focused on, on conduct rather than prudential. Peter, you were running uh, a bank, a UK bank that was probably at the forefront of globalization, of complexity, um, of, of, of effectively changing the nature of the bank and becoming a much more uh, investment banking and wholesale markets focused institution. In that time, and we'll get to the, the excesses in the system in due course, but in that time, you, you saw the change in the supervision from the bank to the FSA. Did you notice immediate differences from the bank being your supervisor to the FSA? And if so, what were they? No, I don't think there were any immediate differences. There were certainly differences which grew over time. I happen to not think there's a perfect structure between the central bank and the, the government, if you like, for supervision or economic policy. And uh, if things are going well, well, it's fine to have all the instruments in one place. If they're not going well, you need checks and balances. But the problem in all this is the banking system. The question is, is being responsible for the banking system a conflict that gets in the way of uh, proper economic management, or is it a benefit? Because you can see the risks that develop in the banking system. And I think this remained a di dichotomy throughout this time, and still does. So yeah, the system changed. It got a bit more vigor rigorous, but not much. And uh, it was developing in a way which I think it's quite right. The banking system really wasn't being gripped by anybody. David, you were wearing two hats at this time as a director <laughs> of the Bank of England and obviously as a, as a senior advisor to UBS, which itself was going through multiple changes, the merger with Wahlberg, then the merger with SBC. How did you view this? 
Well, that latter part of the the uh, SBC UBS SG Warburg part um, was not uh, an area of my sufficient, really particularly involved uh, in, in in those particular details because they were they were very much taken over by in the first instance by uh, SBC and then subsequently by the SBC UBS combination. But um, unlike most of the other panelists, um, I think I. And probably the only person who was the subject of the Bank of England supervision for the whole of my for the whole of my banking career, um, starting back in the 1950s, and uh, and right up until I I really finished active banking in the um, in the late 90s. The um, I was um, um, very aware throughout that whole period that the supervisory activities of the bank uh, were evolving the whole time. They went through, um, they went through periods of efficiency and competence and success, and they went through um, periods of great difficulty and lack of success. Uh, things like the secondary banking crisis and the, and the, uh, um, and, and the period during which uh, BCCI which of course was the firm responsibility of the Luxembourg, um, of the Luxembourg supervisor, and not of the Bank of England. The Bank of England was really a subcontractor to Luxembourg. Um, and I think that the during that period on the, on the supervisory and regulatory side, there was a um, there was a very effective combination between um, between the Bank of England and the community which it for which it assumed regulatory responsibility. Um, and I, that obviously started to change dramatically when the structure of the financial markets changed in 1985, 1986. Um, so I think it went from a period of, of constant evolution and uh, ups and downs, but generally pretty satisfactory, um, as indeed was very succinctly analyzed by Brian Quinn in his, in his memoirs, um, and, um, and which, which uh, uh, is referred to in this excellent book, but um, after that, I think it all it all changed and is uh, has been somewhat rocky. I think I think Brian is with us in the audience today. And Brian, if you'd like to post a question, we'd be delighted to uh, read it out to our to our panel here. Um, I wonder if, if David, you could just sort of like talk to us about whether whether the regulator, wherever the regulator sat, would have been able to keep up with the pace of change that you described not just through the 80s and the 90s, but through to 2007 as well. I mean, there, there, are, there were many banks who, um, and Patricia alluded to exposures, there were many banks who, who had no idea what their exposures were internally. So what chance would a, would a regulator have had to know the same? It's, it's, uh, I think it's a very interesting question. When um, um, Swiss Bank Corporation and UBS got together, um, how they got together is immaterial to this discussion, but it became it became the responsibility of the of the um, uh, UBS financial team of the of the Swiss Bank Corporation financial team to um, try to understand and work out what the positions of UBS were, and uh, and to bottom them out so they could understand the reality of their exposure. Um, the team that did that in SBC were an extremely, extremely accomplished and interesting uh, group of people from Chicago who were mostly um, natural scientists. They were mostly physicists, engineers, astrophysicists. That's where their discipline came from and where, how they'd got into the financial world. And um, it took them more than two years to actually bottom out the UBS net position, more than two years. And that I think was very illustrative of just how complicated um, that, that th those uh, liabilities and assets had become. And, uh, and of course, against that sort of background, I don't think any of the regulators and supervisors had a cat's, hell in cat's hope and chance in hell of actually being kept au courant with what was happening. Ian, would you agree with that? Um. It, it, it changes over time. I think um, David's absolutely right. 
uh, there are huge complications in the uh, books and exposures uh, of banks and that became more complicated and more difficult to disentangle as risk management techniques got more sophisticated. Nonetheless, it seems to me that, um, uh, and I speak as one who's never actually been a bank supervisor, uh, one of my proud boasts was that, that I managed to get through my career at the Bank of England, Bank of England <laughs> without actually ever supervising any financial institution at all. Um, but um, it seemed to me that um, if you could kind of focus on the basics, uh, which by which I mean the competence of the management, uh, the adequacy of capital, uh, particularly on liquidity management, adequacy of liquidity, uh, on the uh, risk management systems uh, and on the governance process uh, and how far that actually scrutinized what the management of the bank were doing uh, through the board, through the auditors, through the um, regulator themselves, then it's reasonably possible to have a kind of um, uh, oversight of a financial institution, individual institution, uh, which won't, of course, give you proof against uh, shocks and upsets, but it'll give you a, a, a reasonable basis to think that um, the, the institution is, is being um, soundly run and, um, and, and avoiding undue risks without necessarily having uh, the detailed knowledge of, of the book that, um, uh, that, that you might otherwise need. Patricia, it sounds like maybe you think that the, the supervisors were worrying a little bit too much about whether banks were being nice to their customers in their branches rather than worrying about whether RBS had sufficient capital. But you, is that a fair characterization of your thoughts? Not, well, I think there was a, a very high focus on conduct risk. And, and in the summer of 2007, when the banks were under very severe liquidity pressure, I had bankers ringing me up. I was at Ernst & Young by then, ringing me up and saying, we've just had a visit from the um, FSA and all they wanted to talk about was conduct risk, whereas actually the key issue was quite clearly liquidity at that point. So I, I, think, I think it was just the balance of their focus was too much, I think, on conduct. And I think they had also taken a fundamental decision that they did not want to interfere in banks' business models. And if you've taken that decision and you're not going to use capital requirements to try and, for example, um, penalize much higher risk business models, um, you're taking a, a lot of your armory away and then you're not going to react to the buildup in risk. And so I, I do think there were fundamental issues in the, in the FSA. I think to start with, um, it worked reasonably well between the bank and the FSA in the sense that the senior individuals had all worked with each other for a long time in the bank together. I worked very well with uh, Oliver Page, for example, my opposite number in the FSA. But it was this closeness to what was going on in the banks, which would really only get out of a prudential discussion rather than the data that was uh, absent, I think. And I think because of their various decisions and focus in the FSA, they weren't reacting fast enough to really what was going on on the ground. Thank you, Patricia. Peter, did you ever at Barclays think Gosh, we're surprised the regulators are not on us more about our level of risk and the amount of capital that we have. Well, they're two different questions, I think, actually, because I'm not a great fan of capital. I've never known a circumstance when you when a bank's been able to use its capital. If there's a crisis, you're always told you want more. However, that's a side issue. I sort of agree with David. I think following the Paribas announcement, it became clear that none of the big banks had any idea what their position was. And I don't see, however good the governance might have been, that it would have dealt with this fundamental flaw. People just didn't understand what was happening in the development of derivatives and fancy financial arrangements and 
it turned out we got a huge problem on our hands that actually nobody was addressing. So when, 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 when push came to shove in the crisis, I think, I think we all accept that there were risks that no one really knew of and no one had a real handle on it, not, e not, e not even Robert Pesson, not even the Financial Times, none of these people <laughs> really did. Um, so, um, so, but but, but, but the, the question becomes, what was lost by the bank not being, uh, being the supervisor at those moments of crisis and big decisions were made. For example, the decision to put HBOS into Lloyd's. Lloyd's was actually relatively strong. HBOS was, as we now know, a basket case. Um, I wonder whether you think the bank would have said, no, that is not the right thing to do. Caution the politicians that were seemingly putting that process together. Um, I don't know who would like to start us off with that. Maybe, maybe Peter, you could just start us off with that one. Well, I'm very happy to do that. I mean, you're right, it was a weird combination, but I think it was done. And the government were actually trying to shore up the banking system at the time. And you've got one bank that was more or less conservatively run and one that actually didn't believe in liquidity. I don't think it's too much to say that the, uh, that the, that the, uh, the Hornby regime sort of believed that because there was a market there, liquidity wasn't really a problem anymore. The problem was getting lending done. Now, it's perfectly possible that if the bank had had more responsibility, they'd have advised against it. But it's also perfectly possible that they might have supported it after all, as David Scully said, the bank's record on supervision wasn't perfect and they don't, didn't have huge, sort of impossibly good foresight. So I think the jury is really out on that. I'm just going to uh, just pause for a second just to bring in Harold, who I think would like to uh, just join our conversation shortly. Harold, please. Yes, thank you, Clark. Um, so, so uh, I, I think you've you've actually got exactly the right discussion going. Um, is it better for a central bank to focus narrowly on monetary policy and on price stability, or uh, was there a requirement uh, that it should have considered financial stability? And then, if it does financial stability, and it does still have some of the functions in financial stability, as the panelists have noted after. 1997, 1998. Um, what's the link between uh, the big picture, uh, the prudential, macro prudential, macroeconomic picture, and uh, what's the link with that with behavior? Because I think there is a link uh, between that. And um, it, it might be worth pointing out, and uh, we, we've already had uh, David Scully mentioned uh, Brian Quinn. Um, uh, Brian Quinn uh, was pushing very much for this, um, not just in the British model, but in the European model when uh, he was involved in the discussions for setting up the future ECB and the ECB statutes. And uh, it's a vision that the Bundesbank uh, pushed uh, back against. Um, and <coughs> it, it, it might, I think, have even won the day in the European discussions. It didn't, uh, but it might have won the day had it not been for the chance fact that BCCI blew up at exactly this moment. And so BCCI looked as if it discredited the Bank of England's approach. And um, you know, that, that remained really as a, as a sort of tragic flaw um, and was always the thing that people brought up, uh, the inability to see this, um, because there were, there were obviously warnings about BCCI. Uh, since the middle of the 1980s, um, and uh, so, so you know, having missed this one, uh, really pushed. I think both in the British level and in the uh, European level uh, for a kind of divorce uh, that really deprived the policymakers of a lot of essential information. At the beginning, in the first session, uh, we were talking about the importance of proximity to the markets, and. In a sense, what 1997, 1998 did was to to, to cap that uh, that exposure uh, to what what markets were thinking about. Um, 
And uh, in that context, then, um, you know, when you think about what the big macroeconomic risks are, what the big prudential risks are, it's much too easy to go into a big laundry list of possible things that might produce crises. And in a way, that's what regulators and supervisors all over the world, not just in the UK, uh, did in the uh, first half of the 2000s. Yeah, I mean, I, I wonder if what was lost was that quiet authority and knowledge of the bank. Um, so, and, and as, as Harold says in his book, the nature of it was that, of course, the things that went wrong became public and all the things that they got right were always kept entirely private. Um, Ian, your thoughts on that? I, I think the, um, the fundamental kind of weakness that emerged in the new regulatory structure after 1997, it took a while to kind of things to change a bit. I think the fundamental weakness seemed to me to be uh, communication between the different um, areas of um, with supervisory responsibility. And I think that exactly the same problem exists whether supervision is inside the central bank or outside it. Uh, you have the difficulty of ensuring that there is uh, adequate communication in a kind of meaningful way uh, between the um, uh, those responsible for the oversight and supervision of individual institutions who can see hopefully what individual institutions are doing but on an individual institution basis so that they don't necessarily see the aggregate picture on the one hand uh, and those who are looking at um, uh, cross industry more aggregate um, developments uh, that may um, threaten the stability of the financial system and um, I think the bank had a pretty good view on the latter set of issues that were uh, carrying threats uh, that materialized in the financial crisis uh, in the early part of the century. Um, and I think the FSA uh, had the uh, individual institutional uh, information. Uh, and the difficulty is communicating the two. Um, but I think you have the same problem if you put supervision inside the bank, inside a, a central bank, that you've got to get the the uh, supervisory line managers to communicate with the um, um, policy making um, people with oversight of the, of the more aggregate um, picture. And I vividly remember um, we used to go to Basel for uh, regular meetings of the BIS of a committee that still, uh, I think, functions, uh, whose job it was to survey the world uh, horizon and try and identify uh, problems and risks and fractures that were um, uh, going to give concern. And uh, we, took, we did it on a Sunday. And we spent the whole of Sunday frightening ourselves stiff with all these uh, terrific <laughs> threats. And then we all reported back to our governors about uh, these uh, new threats to the financial system that we had identified, and the governors would discuss them. And then we would all go home, and not an awful lot happened. Uh, so you've got to try and get that kind of um, aggregate analysis linked into the individual institutions and that seems to me that it's that communication line that's terrifically important yeah patricia i think i think ian hits on something important there we, we we talk about complexity we also obviously went into an era that continues this day of globalization enormous cross-border institutions some of them based in the uk nearly every large international bank has a big uk uh business of some sort because of its center as, as, as the as the financial trading capital of the world um, do you do you think that you know what what hope does a national regulator have in this global time? How much of it is you have to be more coordinated globally? Uh, I, I think this global issue is fundamental, and I think it, it was actually partly at the heart of the last crisis. Really. Um, um, a national supervisor or financial stability authority can't really delve into the guts of somebody else's market. We were looking in the bank at the um, multi-trillion dollar structured products market. We were looking at the huge growth in RMBS. It was almost impossible to get real information on what was going on. And what came out after the crisis hit was of course that the banks had stopped originating the higher risk assets and they were being or originated by mortgage brokers who were not asking for all the information from the borrowers 
and the banks themselves have cut due diligence. So you had a, a fault line running under this multi-trillion market. And I think um, one of the reasons for the push behind the financial stability board globally, the FSB, is to try and get more information on global markets because although the assets were being originated in America, going into pools in America, they were going out globally into the, into the balance sheets of the banks. Um, and the push behind the FSB was to try and enable more information to be gathered on these national markets, but it still remains difficult, I think, delve deep enough into someone else's market that you can see that, that you know, due diligence isn't happening it's at a very granular level. Um, so I think globalization and the interlinkages across um, different financial institutions, different countries, it does make it more difficult. And it means that these global organizations trying to look at the growth of global risk, really important, but still really hard. David, maybe you could just talk to us a little bit about the, the, the global imperative when it comes to financial regulation. Who, me? Yes, please, David, yeah. Well, I'd like to go back, if I may, to um, uh, something which Charles Goodhart said, where he talked about uh, performance being um, uh, being a, the consequence of procedure. Um, but there's a, actually a, another P which I think he omitted from that. It also reflects very much the, um, the abilities and the personalities of the people involved. So it's, um, uh, it's, it's people then performance and then procedure and then, and then, and then performance. And uh, you specifically in the earlier question referred to the, the HBOS uh, Lloyd's uh, combination. Um, well, I remember being told, I think, um, it being admitted by the Lloyd side that at the time that opportunity arose, um, they did only a fraction of the due diligence that they would normally have expected themselves to have done on an acquisition of that nature. And um, uh, that, of course, was not a, a, at a time when, when the, um, the Bank of England was, uh, was supervising um, that particular sort of activity. Um, all I can say is that if uh, that proposition had been brought to the Bank of England in earlier times and put up before George Blunden or Brian Quinn, um, the um, interviewing as to what amount of due diligence was, what the rationale was, what the proposed structures were, what the policies and strategies were going to be, would have been absolutely excruciating for the people under examination. Um, I spent many occasions being being examined by Blunden or Quinn on various things that we were doing. And it was a, um, how shall I put it, a character forming experience. So um, I think that that was, uh, that was another example of how uh, with, that, with that change in responsibilities and that fragmentation, which, um, which both Ian and Patricia referred to, um, left, so many, left so many gaps between the, uh, between the various plates of of responsibility um, that um, it was virtually impossible for there to be um, a, a sort of set successful control. However, looking to the future, I think that there are two things that are um, that, that have happened since then, which should be able to be um, should be able to be brought brought to benefit. And one of this, of course, is the ability both to accumulate and to interpret and analyze big data. And I think that, um, that big data and, um, and artificial intelligence are going to play an increasingly important role in this whole regulation and supervision uh, and question. Um, in the German system, of course, they have had for many decades, I think for many generations, uh, they have had some uh, systems of, of, of integration between, within the banking system, whereby uh, the, the data about exposures has been aggregated, and um, the um, and and the supervisors have been able to 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 see. This, of course, was in less complicated times. But been see what the what the makeup of the exposures were. That obviously is something which is, has been completely different since the 
since the, um, the, the days of much more technical financial products. Uh, Alan Greenspan, I think, probably took all our breath away when he, um, I think he would have used the word admitted, that he had assumed that um, bankers would have regarded it in their self-interest to be aware at the most senior levels of what their exposures and compositions of their assets and liability books were. And that uh, therefore he didn't see that the, that the Federal Reserve Board uh, needed to um, carry out any sort of inspection or analysis of what they were. I think that, um, I think that took all our breath away, including his own. So um, I think that technology is going to be a very considerable uh, advantage in these future controls and the increasingly globalized uh, financial and technical world, um, provided that the um, provided that supervisors are given the resources, both the uh, technical and the human resources, uh, to um, to carry out that function in a 21st century way, in a digital world. Well, I, I want to get onto the digital world in a second, but maybe, maybe Patricia, you could just talk to, talk to us about. It seems in its nature that for all that we've had corrections and the banking industry has become a more uh, well-behaved corporate citizen. It is in the nature of a bank that it will stay try to stay at least half a step, if not a full step, ahead of the regulators. So, ca ca can the regulator ever keep up, even with this new technology and the new tools that David has described? I think the supervisors are reasonably close to the risks in the banks. I think the key issue is, is the non-banks, the shadow banks. And um, as you increase the capital requirements on the banks um, and you create an environment where there's search for yield, assets move into the non-bank sector and it's very hard then to aggregate the exposures and it's very hard to look at all the interlinkages so if you look at for example project finance it's very largely moved into funds with direct investment from pension funds insurance companies insurance companies are doing direct lending etc cetera, etc cetera. so that shadow banking world is still very hard to track so you go on focusing more and more on the regulated sector and you put more and more pressure on the regulated sector through extra capital requirements and so on and so forth. Um, and then you drive business elsewhere. So, so I think, I mean, risk is like water. It just flows around the system. And, and how, do you, how do you track all of the interlinkages remains, I think, difficult. Let's talk about some of those new things that have to be tracked. Um, you mentioned non-banks, and, and we certainly see in the world of, for example, payments, lots of non-banks becoming really active players, certainly in Asia. That, I mean, the, 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 the non-bank payment providers have become the leaders in many Asian countries. Um, we have the whole issue of artificial intelligence. We have other, other advances like central bank digital currencies. How... How important are these? How can the bank and what role should the bank have in regulating, overseeing and, and ensuring that the probity of, of these new types of finance that are coming through now? Um, Peter, maybe you can start us on that. Yeah, well, <clears throat> of course, non-banks aren't new. They've always been non-banks. Ever since they've been banks, the dividing line and the definition of what's a bank is a sort of art form, really, and has changed hugely over time. I, I think, you see, I'm not very confident about the future of supervision. It seems to me that all the things that help it, including technology, also open up opportunities. And it's going to be very, very difficult indeed with anything, any sort of known political system to keep up with making sure you're supervising the right thing at the right time. I think non-banks are just one case. What happens if you get a regulated sector is you get a huge growth around the sides. But it's not new. I mean, when I first joined Barclays, Ford, 
and uh, uh, General Electric had financial organizations were, which were at least as big as the banks. So I think trying to keep an eye on, on this is, is going to be very difficult because politics isn't a continuous process. You, things go and then you change, they go and then you change. And it's the go period that I think is the dangerous one. Ian, do you share Peter's pessimism there? I'm sure Peter's right in that kind of analysis, but I don't know that I'm quite as pessimistic as he is about the ability of um, the um, regulatory authorities to uh, keep some kind of uh, tabs on what's happening. I mean, I think um, markets and financial structures uh, always change. There are always innovations. There are always kind of new ideas and new schemes. And they're pretty complicated and they're pretty puzzling and everybody's pretty horrified as to whether they can understand what's going on. Uh, when exchange control was dismantled at the end of the 70s, there was a huge explosion of financial innovation and uh, businesses crashing across barriers and um, leading, as we know, to the Big Bang and quite remarkable changes in structure. Um, and um, we all thought, you know, that's going to be um, complete mayhem. How the hell are we ever going to keep tabs on what's going on there? But actually, uh, you do begin to kind of get some idea of what's going on. You do begin to get some way of um, uh, trying to uh, uh, help it find uh, uh, a, a, a basis for uh, orderly conduct of business. Uh, you can do it through um, a dialogue, you can do it through uh, codes, you can do it through law, you can do it through... Um, um, but um, And of course, it's never perfect, and you're always a bit behind the game, as somebody once said, the art of financial supervision uh, is always to be one step behind the market, but only one step behind, preferably. Um, you're never going to be uh, ahead of the game. Um, but I don't think um, the new changes we're seeing now make that um, uh, somehow systemically impossible. Uh, it just makes the, the, the challenges are different, just different. We are, we're coming to about our last 10 minutes, so I encourage the audience to please do send in them, their questions if you do have any at this stage. I'd like each of the panellists just to spend a little bit of time on this next point, which is, which is the role of the bank... Um, in this current in extraordinary environment in which we find ourselves with, 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 with the bank having to take unprecedented action to support the economy um, and, and, and what that means for the bank um, and what it, means, what it means for its future as well. We, we, we really do find ourselves in extraordinary times. Um, David, perhaps you could start on that. Well, I think I'm probably the least qualified of all your panellists and everybody <laughs> else to express an opinion on that, so I will do so. Um, I think it, it, it is absolutely certain that there has to be um, very, very close uh, cooperation and policy sharing between those responsible for fiscal policy and those responsible for monetary policy. Um, the, um, what has in, in, in the past become not necessarily to totally coordinated or accepted as being as being necessary seems to be absolutely as for essential as essential for this, and um, on the other hand, I think that the the um, separate responsibilities of the bank uh, for um, uh, for monetary policy and for prudential regulation in its present form are going to be also increasingly increasingly um, important and valid because the um, the, the the combined the combined effect of, of uh, human nature, money and leverage will always be there. And it will always be there as, a, as an overriding temptation to stretch the limits. And uh, we're going to have to uh, live with a system where we have, when we have fail failures and catastrophes, that has been the case for several centuries and will be for several centuries ahead. And, uh, and so um, in times of, of uh, crisis and sort of recovery, we hope that we're going to see post-COVID, um, they're going to be even more dangerous. So I think that it's something which um, uh, is, uh, is going to be feasible and possible. But um, what um, 
uh, Ian Plenleaf was saying about the importance of of, uh, of cooperation, uh, coordination, and uh, uh, communication is absolutely essential. Thank you, David. Peter, on the same subject, please. Well, <clears throat> I think uh, the one set step behind, which I believe regulators always are, is getting to be a bigger and bigger step because the economy is getting bigger and it's getting more complicated. And I just think that the trying to regulate uh, an incomplete system uh, by methods that are just slightly behind the ones the system is using in its totality is impossible, but we've got to do our best. I don't see any alternative to that. But the, 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 bank, the bank has been sort of almost drawn back into politics. Obviously, the bank, feel, I think everyone feels more comfortable, the bank feels more comfortable when it is away from politics. That was one of the things that was decided in 97. Do you think it is being, Peter, and then I'll come to Patricia and Ian, do you think it is being at the moment drawn back into that because of the role that it has to play now, or whether it is in, uh, as Norman, I think, alluded to in the first panel, being drawn into, should we have green guilt? Should we have this policy? Should we have that policy? What, what, well, what do you think that means I for think, the future? I think once you uh, move from having a very simple objective like... Uh, keeping inflation down to a much more complicated one, like keeping the economy going, you are inevitably going to be in the role of politics, inevitably. And in a way, checks and balances, where one part of the system's doing fiscal policy, the other's doing monetary policy, is a way of bringing you into politics. That's what it is. OK, Patricia, your thoughts on, on the role of the bank now? <laughs> well, I think the bank is playing a crucial role. I mean, it's it's um, hugely involved in the lending schemes that are going out to support the economy through through COVID, etc. It, it was massively involved in quantitative easing. I, I, I think that, to my mind, the issue is is how do you, to what extent should the bank be weighing up the distortions that are coming out of some of the policies? So, you know, with quantitative easing, there seemed to be a law of diminishing returns, but the, the distortions coming out of it were just growing and growing. So enormous distortions have been seen in the mortgage market with negative real um, interest rates on mortgages across a wide spectrum. And so I, th I think the, the difficult thing is, is at what point do you say enough is enough, that actually there is a law of diminishing returns and there may be a small return, but the distortions are growing and growing in, in terms of the financial sector and also the economy. You, you distort the balance between the savers and the rest of the, the economy. So I, I, I think that is an issue that is going to grow actually. Thank you, Patricia. Ian, same, same thoughts on the, on the role and the mandate of the bank today uh, in the... Yeah, I'm, I'm not a kind of um, perfectionist, really. I think um, one has to do the best one can in um, difficult circumstances, and these are extremely um, <laughs> un, un, unprecedentedly uh, difficult circumstances. Um, it seems to me that the bank has a clear kind of uh, core responsibilities, uh, a set of core responsibilities, but it's always actually found that it's being um, uh, drawn into um, uh, more peripheral activities to the public, it hopes the public good. Uh, and of course, the critical thing has always been to decide where the bank could usefully make a contribution and where it couldn't. Um, fast forward from that to um, the present situation, COVID, I don't think the bank is really possible for it to say when, when the, it's rung up and told we're actually having the worst global crisis since the Second World War, can you possibly help for the bank to say, well, no, actually, it's outside our uh, 
our brief. Of course, we, the bank has to do whatever it can to help, and that takes us into actions uh, in all sorts of areas. Um, it seems to me in an emergency, it has to do that. Then you have to, when things calm down. To... I've just lost Ian there. I think. I think is, is everybody else just lost Ian there quickly? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, but that you know that's for the future. Okay, thank you, Ian. Um, I'm just going to come to Harold again for a, for a quick closing thought in a second. I just have one slightly cheeky question to ask. Mervyn talked earlier about uh, about the, the bank sort of moving from being a, a, an institution with mystique to being one that was open and transparent. But I, I we've alluded to this already in this conversation. I wonder if there is something missing in the uh, in that ability of, of the bank or the governor to sit down quietly with 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 senior people and and effectively to. Um, execute or, or inspire change without much discussion. So, so to put it another way, how powerful are Andrew Bailey's eyebrows these days? Um, David, maybe you'd like to start with that one. <laughs> well, I think that um, I think that Eddie's Eddie's comment of doing good by stealth um, is part of the mystique, and um, mystique is probably that is probably an, an outdated word because. Uh, it's it's uh, contrary to transparency and all those other fashionable things, but doing good by stealth is not is not outdated. Um, I think that um, um, Andrew has um, a marvelous marvelous background uh, for um, carrying on that sort of spirit of the bank, however widened and broadened or deepened its its mandate is, um, or not not necessarily its uh, explicit mandate. But there is also an implicit mandate for a central bank, um, and uh, whereas uh, uh, our bank didn't have a sort of proper articulated mandate until 1998, uh, it had been evolving its own mandate since 1694, and uh, and that I hope there will be an element of that to continue. Um, uh, so it isn't it isn't eyebrows, but um, what uh, what could be done with 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 feet under the table. Is uh, can be quite as effective as eyebrows. Do the rest of the panel agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. I agree entirely with David. Super. I'll, yeah. I'll, just bring, I'll just bring, sorry, Peter, was there something there? I was going to say, I think it depends what it is. I think the way the world works now, and the way the UK works, use, you've got to be very careful using eyebrows that you're not doing something that's contrary to the policy you're supposed to be pursuing. I think, I think it has got more difficult. Okay, thank you, Peter. Harold, just, just come to you now for a few thoughts as we, as we wrap up the panel. Well, thank you. Uh, on that last point, uh, I mean, indeed, that, that is part of the big evolution. And uh, in the late 1980s, uh, people were already talking about shaving off the governor's eyebrows. Um, and uh, if you ask yourself what that means, uh, I think you have to say you really need the policy issues to be framed in a general way so that they can be widely discussed by the people uh, to whom in the end politicians and also the central bank is accountable. And in this particular instance, if you think about this, the story of the, uh, the economic shock produced by COVID, and also the big savings that are accumulating in the COVID era, uh, then I think you really need to put on the table quite firmly uh, what the choices are. And they're unpleasant choices. They're either higher taxes or they're higher rates of inflation. Uh, but either of those are possible ways of dealing with this. Uh, but simply to think that you, you can't discuss those issues, um, I think is a way of fostering really quite harmful conspiracy theory. So uh, you know, part, of, part of the openness of the bank has to be uh, to put on the table, quite frankly, what the policy options must be in the new environment. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. And, and thanks also to Harold um, for, for the book that's inspired this afternoon's discussions uh, and to our panellists, to Ian, to Patricia, to Peter and to David. Thank you for that very good discussion. I mean, it tees us up nicely now to hand back over to David Marsh, who is going to um, chair our closing panel discussion, uh, which has the title of Balancing Responsibilities. So thanks again to the panel. Thanks for your questions. And back to you, David.
Yes, thank you very much indeed, uh, Clive, and thank you to the panel. And I have a sense of foreboding, actually, during the whole of this uh, period, that something is going to hit us in some way. Uh, I think there's no sense of complacency that everybody's got everything right. And in this final panel, we're going to be talking about what might be coming back to hit us, we're going to also be exploring a bit more the interlinkages between the fiscal and monetary policy, which uh, we've not dealt with too much. And, but also, I do want to go back over the ground some of the historical issues that we still need to clear up. And all, all of my five panellists have made very great contributions, actually, to this story. I'm just going to introduce them in the uh, order in which they will be speaking. First of all, Ed Balls, who was Dustily Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer between 2011 and 2015, because he was just inching his way gingerly onto the dance floor, so to speak, in the 1990s as Gordon Brown's chief advisor before the Labour government took power in 1997. And therefore, he's got quite a role to play there. We'll be telling us a little bit about that as well. Deanne Julius, uh, who is a multifaceted lady uh, from North America. Uh, she was put onto the Monetary Policy Committee uh, as one of the external members in 1997, really to show the breadth of diversity that the British could summon up. You've done more, more or less everything, Deanne, in your life. You started off as an analyst for the CIA, for example, and you also chief economist at Royal Dutch Shell and British Airways. So I'm looking forward to what you have to say. Bill Keegan, the doyen of financial journalists who's been following all this, but also he worked uh, for a while at the Bank of England. You've got one or two choice stories about that, uh, Bill, and you can tell us a little bit about the pink coats and so on. Don Cohn, who's uh, still a practicing central banker because he's on the Financial Policy Committee of the Bank of England and has been there for several years. You played a very important role in 2000 before you went onto the board of the uh, governors of the Fed. You were secretary of the FOMC and you were head of the monetary policy division, and you actually gave Britain some advice about the MPC and what kind of models we should be following. And you were a vice chairman of the, of the board during that period of time when you were on the board of the Federal Reserve. And then Paul Tucker, fascinating individual uh, who's written a great book as well, uh, Unelected Power, which is like a companion uh, novel almost to uh, Harold's. It's even longer than Harold's as well and uh, well worthwhile reading. But of course, you were the deputy governor uh, in uh, 2009 to 2013. You're at Harvard, you're the chair of the Systemic Risk Council. And um, very importantly, you were the principal private secretary to Robin Lee Pemberton in his final four years. So, um, Ed, uh, to you, you've, you've got a role, I think, in, in the past. I'd like to just ask you about that uh, briefly. It did seem to come as a bit of a surprise, even to the Treasury, that the uh, monetary policy operational competence of the, of, the, of the Treasury was going to be transferred to the Bank of England in 1997. You'd had several conversations with Terry Burns, I know that, um, in the period leading up to the election win, which is what generally uh, expected. Can you just say a few words about the general level of surprise, both in the Treasury and also in the... Bank of England, why was it kept so secret beforehand, this, this march to independence in 1997? I think it was a, um, a surprise, David, and that's partly because of, um, uh, because although we had prefigured reform of the Bank of England in the manifesto, we hadn't said we were going to move to full independence and uh, certainly as quickly as we set out. Partly because what was happening in the months before the election was there was an argument between the Chancellor, Ken Clark and Eddie George about interest rates with Eddie advocating um, a, a higher interest rates. I don't think we wanted to be caught in a position pre-election of looking like we were arguing for higher interest rates at the, uh, at the time. Um, and I think there was an assumption in the Treasury, certainly in parts of the Bank of England, we wouldn't move to independence until we made a decision about the, the Euro. But obviously what we did was, was to have um, a reform of the Bank of England, which was not compliant with the Maastricht Treaty. It became an alternative to joining the Euro rather than a stepping stone towards it. I guess the thing I would like to say, having heard the earlier discussions, is that I don't think it's right to talk about there being an inevitability um, about what was happening in this uh, period. Now, I think Harold has written a really interesting, very full book. It's a book of contemporary history. Uh, I've been teaching a class at King's with Lord Nick McPherson for the last six years on the, the Treasury and economic policy since 1945. And in contemporary history, you piece together different views um, from different players as you reach a full view through the fullness 
of time. And I think there'll be lots of people who would need to read Ken Clark's book or Norman Lamont's book, uh, and maybe some of the contributions from people like Terry Burns and Alan Budd to get a full picture of what happened in 1992. But in that build up to 1997, first of all, as, ha as Harold says, there were problems in the Bank of England around financial supervision and things which had gone wrong. There was a personalization and the relationship between the chancellor and the, and, the, uh, and the governor, which was destabilizing. I think also the constitutional arrangements weren't in place uh, in order to move to independence, unless you really quite substantially change the system. I think from my point of view, um, unless you had a system in our parliamentary world, um, it's different in the constitutional world, where uh, if the government is accountable to parliament for all of these decisions, the government has to set the objective inflation target. I think for it to be effective, it had to be clear and transparent and symmetric. And the target we inherited in 97 wasn't that. And I think also you needed those independent voices uh, on the Monetary Policy Committee. So this wouldn't be seen, as Harold talks about in his book, as a, as a kind of monarchy where the governor made the decision supported by individuals on the full-time Bank of England staff below him. It was only by moving to the committee and the nine voices and the individual vo votes to deliver um, policy to meet a clear symmetric target set by the Chancellor. That was the reform which worked. That wasn't on the table before 1997. And I think without those wider uh, 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 accountabilities, I think independence wouldn't have happened, couldn't have happened. And let's be honest, neither Norman Lamont or Ken Clark were able to make it happen. So it wasn't inevitable. It required a big change. Well, it, and it's very good because we'll just ask Deanne Julius in a moment as a member of that first Monetary Policy Committee about her role there. But just before we do that, and I'd like to ask you some other forward-looking questions um, a, a little bit later on. Uh, Harold says in his book that by the time of the financial crisis in 2007, the, the bank was a little bit like the famous hedgehog, the hedgehog and the fox. Uh, I think Isaiah Berlin, but several other people have written essays about this. It just concentrated on one thing. It was very good at one thing. Uh, it wasn't a fox that could do lots of things. It was a hedgehog. It could just do one thing. Was that a, a danger, always implicit in the system that you set up, that the bank would become very, very good at monetary policy but not very good at financial stability, which it had also been asked to do? Or was that just a question of the personalities? As I said earlier to Mervyn, he just wasn't very interested in financial stability. Well, I think Harold says this in the book, that once Mervyn became the, the governor, the bank focused less on financial stability issues. They weren't a personal focus of the governor. Mervyn told me that himself when he became the governor. There was more of an arm's length relationship with the financial services uh, uh, authority. The system was designed from the beginning not to have one deputy governor but to have two deputy governors, one for monetary policy and for financial stability. There were three times as many people working on financial stability in the Eddie George years as there were on monetary policy. Um, all the information was there if the bank wanted it. Every meeting they wanted they could have had. There was an argument at the time because there were senior figures in the bank um, who didn't think that should be the focus of the bank. They wanted it to be more on the monetary policy side. And I think that is the way in which things evolved over time. I was kind of surprised when Mervyn did his, uh, his BBC Today programme lecture after he finished gov being governor, in which he seemed to suggest that it would have been better if the bank had kept responsibility for supervision back in 1997. But that was absolutely not the conversations we were having at the, the time. I think the problem was... Um, uh, as Peter Middleton said, whether inside or outside, um, supervision is complicated and you need a dialogue with the Treasury because these are the guys in charge of the overall budget, but also with the central bank because these are the people worrying about the system to make sure that individual risk is seen in a systemic context. And the yes, fact well, I, I think that's a very good point. It, the it, fact is, Peter, I, I, in that period, that wasn't seen. It wasn't seen partly because everybody missed it. But it also wasn't seen because the bank by that point wasn't looking hard enough to try and find those those risks at the governor level. Yes, I think there would have been some eyebrows raised at that point he made on the two day program. By the way, I rather like the halo background that you've got with that uh, rather nice orb in, in the background. There is looks yeah, like no you look like the angel Gabriel, actually. No, no but, <laughs> 
Could, could I go on to now, Diane? Uh, Diane, you, you arrived at the Bank of England after this stellar international career. You were very much part of this idea of enshrining diversity. As Ed says, it wasn't supposed to be a decision just put with the governor. There was supposed to be a, a team of people, four from the bank, four from the Treasury, governor casting a vote. How did that system work, Diane? Well, I think there's no denying that the bank had a little uh, problem, little teething problems with these four external um, diverse characters, two of us not British citizens even at the time. And if they, you and uh, William Beiter, weren't you? you, they, you they were the, the token foreigners there. <laughs> well, yes, and indeed, all four of us had different, uh, different personalities and different ways of looking at the data. Uh, certainly, I remember with, when I first met Eddie in the bank after I'd actually taken up the role, uh, coming from the corporate sector, I, I asked him, uh, so who did I report to? I wanted to make sure I understood the, uh, the rules of this new game. And he rather stuttered and stammered a little bit. And then and I said, well, do I report to you, Eddie? And he said, well, no, not exactly. I guess maybe it's the Treasury Select Committee. Uh, and I think that was extremely helpful to me uh, and certainly also meant that he understood exactly how this was meant to work because it did mean that, uh, that I could independently challenge others in the bank when the hierarchy didn't really work in our favor. And I have to say that the difficulty for the bank of fitting in the four of us um, was substantial. You know, we, we were not really meant to wander around and talk to the economics staff, for example. If I, wanted, if I had a question on something that came up on uh, one of the briefing papers, uh, I tended to just pick up the phone and wanted to talk to that person. Well, it had to be set up as a meeting, uh, usually in my office so that I wasn't uh, loose wandering around upstairs. Um, and the division chief always came with the staff member. And so you had to have a bit of a battle over your resources, didn't you? Well, exactly. You know, if, if one of us wanted to have some additional research done, on the uh, labor market or something that was in the forecast, uh, it had to go through the prioritization process within the monetary uh, analysis part of the bank. And so this, this was really unsatisfactory and it, uh, it, it hit the newspapers to some extent. It meant that we ended up having to go to court, uh, which is the, the bank of the, the governors of, of the central bank uh, to get that resolved so that we could at least get some research done on things which we felt individually were important to our own view. But I think you did have an ice breaking role. And I would have thought that the external policy members these days are, are, are fully part of the bank's operating mechanisms. I think that's true. I mean, it's, it's a little hard to tell these days because there are so few uh, votes against the majority. And, and you know, my colleagues there now have had, uh, didn't have the chances we did to raise interest rates, lower interest rates, do our, uh, our own fine tuning of the forecast, all of these sorts of things. Uh, debate the the minutes and the to make sure that the minutes always reflected uh, any minority view. Uh, there aren't many minority views now, so it's a little hard to tell just how it, much. It, it was probably much more fun in those days, far more blood and guts, weren't there, in lots of ways. Let's go to Bill Keegan, a uh, veteran from The Observer, but also with a spell at the Bank of England. Bill, what are your overall impressions of the book and the way it portrays all this intellectual skullduggery that went on over the years between the bank and the treasury, and also several people, including Ian Pendleth and Norman Lamont, have both defended the bank against the idea that it was somehow stuffy and old fashioned and anachronistic. They said it wasn't. What, what was your view, Bill, as somebody who's looked at this from many sides over the years? It, it's, it's such a good question, but I can't see that Bill is there. So we're, we're going to have to go on to the uh, Have you next, got can you hear me? Yes, we, we can. Did you hear my my question, yes, I heard Bill? The question. Good. Um, I struggle. I've always believed in technology as an economist, but I struggle with it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yes, the several thoughts came there. Just before answer your questions, one thing about the, I think one aspect um, that Ed and Co had in mind when introducing the Monetary Policy Committee was to try and divert attention from the governor being the central figure. But as far as I could see, Mervyn continued to be the central figure in public, and so did Mark. The question is, will Andrew Bailey be? But uh, so the, the governor was always very powerful. Anyway, stuffiness. Um, it was very stuffy in 76-7 when I was there, and I think it was pretty stuffy later on. I think Gordon Richardson and um, Christopher Dow wanted to do something about that, and in particular, um, 
uh, George Blunden, and I think that's brought out well in, in the book. But I'll give you an example of the, when I was at the bank, it seemed that one quarter of the staff were actually watching the other three quarters. There was a huge personnel division. And uh, when I was, um, when I was, uh, when I had the good luck to meet my present wife, Hilary Stonecross, who was then um, a, a bank official, um, I think Paul will remember this and possibly Patricia, um, the most astonishing aspect of stuffiness came up the bank. Somebody in that organization told Hilary that she had to stop seeing me if she was to be promoted to work for Charles Goodhart on monetary policy because um, monetary policy was central and I was a critic of it. This was showed such a ridiculous, um, you know, it was it, about five levels, it was wrong. It, it showed lack of trust of her, lack of trust of me. It was bad anyway. And furthermore, um, I, was, I was talking to all sorts of people who were way above Hillary in the hierarchy. And, and finally, I didn't believe the monetary statistic anyway. But, and, and this was in um, 1983. But I think, I hope we've moved on since then. But it was an extraordinary example, I thought. Um, <laughs> In, in terms of the intellectual badgering that uh, still does go on today, even though there's quite a few Treasury people now as uh, deputy governors, do, do you think the this, we've always rather enjoyed this, I think it's all part of the Punch and Judy show of British politics to have a little bit of a, a you know, gang warfare between the Bank of England and the Treasury. Does this still go on today or is it, is it more intellectual, more civilised these days? The, I think plus a change actually. But I just must finish that, that Hillary thing. Of course, so she left the bank on principle and um, she's had a very highly successful career at the bar. She might have become the first woman governor, but you never know. Anyway, I think the, um, I've, I've heard these criticisms that there isn't enough treasury, but this book is about the bank and the treasury does come up quite a lot. The only uh, omission that I, I, I was surprised that Harold in a really fantastic work uh, hardly mentioned um, the meeting at Bath before the, you know, b b before Black Wednesday, which was a big event, but it, it comes up in passing. But that's that's a minor detail. Well, we'll we'll come back to Harold in a moment. I'm sure there's some things he he left out. Maybe he got a bit bored with writing about Bath, possibly, <laughs> Bill. That might be one of the reasons. Yeah. Um, D Don, thanks very much for joining us from the United States. As I alluded to earlier, you've had quite a big role as in observing the Bank of England, both from afar and then when you were advising on the MPC in the 2000. Uh, and now, of course, um, if you were like a man from Mars, where rather than a, a man from the United States looking at the structure now, would you say that this is fit for purpose? Or would you say, look, um, don't get too uppity, you British, because something's going to hit you and you're not going to be having the right structure. What, what are your thoughts there? How would you reform it if you had to, uh, Don? Uh, thank you, David, and nice to be with you and to discuss this important book. Uh, so I think it is fit for purpose after the reforms following the global financial crisis. So going back to your discussion about uh, about uh, separating supervision from the rest of the bank and having that financial stability function really decline in importance uh, and not have the tools. I mean, it could write very nice financial stability reports, but not really be able to do much about them when the supervision of the banks and the financial system was in another agency. So I think uh, what, the, what the UK did after the crisis, creating, moving bank supervision back into the Bank of England, creating the Financial Policy Committee, where I sit, um, as I was doing this morning, uh, and, uh, and keeping the Monetary Policy Committee, I think that's a very nice uh, set of committees and works very well, and actually works very well together. There's the overlapping membership. We have meetings together. We discuss common issues. So I do think the, the system that was set up uh, that is, exists right now is, is quite a good one. That doesn't mean that something isn't going to happen that catches everybody by surprise. But I think from what we can see right now, we, I, I, I don't have any suggestions for changing the current structure. One thing to note is that it is unique, I think, in the world of having so much authority in one place. 
and a colleague of mine uh, at Brookings, Nellie Lang, has done a survey of uh, macro prudential policy all over the world. And the Bank of England is pretty much alone having all that authority. I think from that perspective, going back to your discussion with Deanne, the role of the externals is pretty important. So bringing outside perspectives and outside expertise, making, voicing our views, I think, uh, I think it really accentuates the importance of the externals and the importance of getting these issues that were certainly there in the late 90s and early 2000s of giving them the resources, making sure they had the voice, et cetera. Yeah, well, I think that's a very important point. And this internationality, which people like Andrew Crockett, I think, wanted all along, it, it certainly does has flourished. Now, Paul, all, all of this conversation, in a way, has been a build up to what you're going to be saying, because, of course, all these issues about the right balance between leadership and transparency and accountability and efficiency, it's all summed up very well. In, in your book. I think you also wanted to say a few words about inflation targeting, what Robin Lee Pemberton really did think about that. But in terms of the structure, can you also answer the question, why is it that the bank somehow through this collection of rather diverse people in the 1990s did actually produce a structure that was adequate for being made independent when Gordon Brown and Ed Balls decided that? You're on mute at the moment, Paul. You may, may need to unmute yourself. Um, so Thank you, David. Um, congratulations, Harold. The book has the right title. It's definitely got the right picture on the front in, in Eddie George. And it was particularly interesting to hear people like David Scoley and Peter Middleton, who were actively involved, central figures in um, the 1980s. I, I wanted to say two things about the past and then use that as a bridge to answering your, your question. What, what the book um, does do has been very well discussed. What it doesn't do is bring out how a series of very complicated um, relationships between the key characters who at the Bank of England's end, I would say, were George Blunden, who hasn't been mentioned enough, Eddie George and Mervyn and one or two um, others, nevertheless produced the results um, that you and others have, have described and how all this kind of set out. And this wasn't easy. To give only one example, um, not only might Eddie not have become governor, he might well not have become deputy governor. Whitehall put up the most extraordinary battle to stop Eddie becoming deputy governor. And I know that because I conducted a good deal of that battle over the phone with my good and late lamented friend, Jeremy Hayward, as the governor's private secretary. And when um, Whitehall relented, um, I can remember, and if he, I wish he were alive still for all, well, it, it's just terrible, He's, we've lost him. Jeremy said to me, okay, okay, but don't imagine that this is a route to the top job. Um, and that does, that's, a, that's an enormous point, and I think a rather revealing um, point. The, the second thing um, to say is there was a kind of um, competition for credit um, earlier on between Mervyn a bit and Norman a bit and some others about the advent of inflation targeting. Whereas the truth is, things like this, successes don't happen without a lot of hands. So I absolutely um, um, am convinced that ideas like this were circulating in, in Treasury. Um, sometime before it happened, but they were also circulating in the bank. I mean, Robin Lee Pemberton, before Mervyn joined the bank, I was also the GPS when Robin raised with the top bras whether or not we ought to be going down the route of, of inflation targeting. So, but what's also true is that, is that when we fell out of the RM, Mervyn and his team were ready, absolutely without doubt, ready. A draft of the first and a mock up of the inflation report was ready. I can remember him bringing it round to the governor for discussion with the governor and Eddie, who by then was, was governor, and saying, So we talked about this. This is kind of what it might look like. And the key thing this was a team that was prepared to fill a vacuum. And that's instructive, I think, because that's exactly what happened in 
after 2008 in the field of financial stability. So something else that I think is not in the book, um, but actually was incredibly important for how things turned out, was that in the early zeros, within the period, um, there was a G10 financial stability forum study on whether or not it was possible to wind down a large and complex financial institution in an orderly way. A marvelous woman called Molly Wassum represented the Federal Reserve on this. And she and I and others who were on this group persuaded the co-chairs, one American, one Dutch, that this was not possible. Um, and the report went up and absolutely nothing happened, which is a complete disgrace. And no historians ever take any interest in it, even though I keep on mentioning it. They, they, they will now, Paul, surely. Well, I've mentioned it on four other occasions. I think for anyone writing a history of this period, I don't mean not of the Bank of England, but of the international financial system, this is a key moment. What it meant was that some years later, when the opportunity arose, um, there, were already some, there were already reasonably crystallized thoughts about how what came to be called resolution policy had to be at the center of any framework for financial stability, that working back from the crisis was just as important as a framework that set out to anticipate and head off crisis. And here I want to mention something else, which was that um, Alistair Clark, I, didn't, I had to go to the, for a comfort break, as they say, when Patricia was talking. And I think Patricia said a lot of things which are not only true, but importantly true. I don't know whether she mentioned Alistair Clark. I don't think she did, no. no as, well, as, you, Al Al as you said, he's not mentioned in the book. Alistair isn't featured in the book. Well, I can tell you, while Patricia and John Trundle and others were getting on with the work, Alistair and I would sit in his office talking about whether or not the post-97 system was going to work. And our conclusion was, and I can remember Alistair saying this to me and me repeating it to him, um, it's going to look as though it works during peacetime, and it's not going to work in a crisis. And we actually were writing a paper when, which never got finished or published because I got promoted. And what I inherited, and the point of this story will become apparent in a second, what I inherited from Ian, um, as well as a kind of pile of work, um, was a private secretary called Matthew Hancock. And Matthew yeah. Hancock and I spent as many hours as Alistair and I did really, thinking about, will the system work? And we reached the conclusion um, that actually something equivalent to the Monetary Policy Committee um, was needed on the financial stability side. And also, which I brought with me from Alistair, that you couldn't take the central bank out of this if it was the lender of last resort. Indeed, my own view in advance was that it would be a disaster uh, for the central bank not to be involved in supervision at all if it was the lender of last resort. Now, here I want to say something about Mervyn. No one on earth has fought Mervyn as much as me on financial stability. Yes. Let us, but let us be absolutely clear about what Mervyn's position was and that it was good. It was sound. And this also played a huge role in 2008, which was, it's all very well, and Don um, pointed towards this. It's all very well producing um, analytical papers and reports. And the financial stability report was important in the run-up to the crisis. And I don't think anyone's ever done a study of how much of what happened is prefigured um, in the financial stability report. And it's not everything, but it's not small. And I hope there are some people in the bank watching who are saying, yes, thank God someone has at last said that um, in public. But with no powers, you can do nothing. And without powers, you don't quite crystallize your thoughts as to what's really going on here that needs to be addressed. Well, uh, uh, Paul, the question, uh, Paul, there's a tremendous they, amount of material one, in, in, in what you've just said. I want to move one, on, if I may. All right, let me say one final thing about George Blunder, because I, I want to bring out the extent to which all of this came from the past. That the PRA was a subsidiary was an idea that George Blunder put to, George, to Gordon Richardson in the late 70s, that George Blunden put to Robin Lee Pemberton in the mid 1980s, and which I put to Robin Lee Pemberton and Eddie George in the early 1990s. These things all happen 
not because they're thought of in a rush, but because people have been spending time working on them for years and years. Well, it really seems as though we've, we've almost got the not the Harold James book here because we've, you've, you've got a lot of material there that w wasn't in the book. So it, you're giving a, a big impetus, I think, to future generations of, of authors. Just before I go on to Ed, because I know, Ed, you've got quite a, a lot to say um, about all this business, also having some kind of oversight council. I just wanted to, to quiz people about A.D. George uh, for a moment, because as you say, it's right that he was put onto the cover. I mean, Bill, you might have a view on this. Uh, not only did the Treasury rather resist him becoming the deputy governor, uh, th originally they didn't really want him to be the governor, did they? Going, If you go back a few years, uh, David Scully was thought of as a candidate, um, as was Dennis Weatherstone. Why did why did the Treasury bill in, in those days, uh, back in uh, before 1993, why did the Treasury, and John Major in particular, take against Eddie George? I don't know, because oddly enough, Mrs. Thatcher, and I'm not her greatest fan, She, I think she was keen on Eddie George and wanted Eddie yeah. George. Yes. Well, it, as, uh, well, somebody told me because he was too short or something like that, but um, it, rather silly idea. Um, Ed, the, Ed um, you, you could maybe comment on why yeah. uh, the Treasury didn't like uh, Eddie George as Deputy Governor, if that indeed was the case. But the much more important question is how you consider all these different bits of the arithmetic could be brought together. I know that you and Don... And Paul rather disagree about whether in the UK we need a kind of F SOC, and also the idea that you've had that, which is that the Financial Stability Committee and the Monetary Policy Committee need to be brought together. Could you just elaborate on some of those thoughts, please, uh, Ed? You're on mute at the moment. Uh, thank you, David. Um, Paul, Paul is right that by the time we got to 2006 7, we knew the system. Um, wasn't fully working properly. We needed further uh, reform. And we, um, we actually, at my instigation, uh, when I was Treasury Minister, instigated a two-week um, war game where we, we gamed through um, dealing with a financial crisis in the end of 2006. Ironically, the case study the bank chose was um, a building society which got into trouble because of securitization had exposed the wider financial system. Yeah. And it ended yeah. up with a, um, a three hour um, uh, final meeting of the stability committee um, between myself and Mervyn uh, and Callum McCarthy, um, where we worked out how we were gonna deal with these issues. And a number of things came out of that. One was that it wasn't exactly clear um, where lender of last resort ended and the use of the government banks, the, 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 and the government's balance sheet started. Um, there were problems around state aids. Uh, there were problems, differences of view about moral hazard and the case for intervention. But of course, the fundamental thing it shows is that within that meeting of the um, of that uh, in that war game, nobody, the bank, the treasury, or the FSA, were ringing the alarm bell about what was happening in the real world, not in the war game around us. At that time, that wasn't being run by the FSA, the supervisor. It wasn't being run by the Bank of England and its whole financial stability wing. It wasn't being run by the, the, the Treasury. People weren't seeing what was happening, and I'm afraid people weren't looking hard enough at what was going on. So Paul's right. We needed uh, reform. Um, and um, in my view, we needed to, to deepen the relationship which underpinned the Stability Committee. Personally, I, uh, I've always been rather neutral as to whether supervision goes in the central bank or into another organization. The important thing is how information flows between the individual regulators, the systemic oversight in the central bank and the treasury, which is the, um, the, uh, the, the, um, the uh, in overall charge because of politics and the government balance sheet. In, in 97, the combination of BCCI bearings, things which had gone wrong, plus our need to put regulation more widely onto a statutory footing led us to a unified regulator. And frankly, at that time, and lots of people in the bank as well as in the Treasury agreed, that actually putting it all into one place separate for the bank, rather than piling all of that other regulation into the bank from the non-statutory organisations at a time when we were going for independence would have been, have been overload. Um, and that was the, 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 the task we took. If you think about how things have evolved since, as I said, I'm neutral as to whether supervision is in the central bank 
or in the um, in another organization. And it's not clear ever quite whether the PRA is another organization or part of the Bank of England, but I guess it's part of the Bank of England. The issue is um, twofold. What is the nature of the information flows between different players in the system, the central bank governor, the monetary policy committee, the head of the PRA, the head of the FCA and the treasury? And how does that information flow in normal times and in a crisis? And secondly, what is the nature of the accountability? And this is where, and I have worries on both, both fronts. With the Monetary Policy Committee, it's clear there is a symmetric target, which is easy to observe, which Parliament and the wider media understands, which is set by the Chancellor and then delivered by the MPC. When you move into the world of financial stability, things are much more opaque. The target is much less clear. There, there, is, there is less transparency in the operation of the FPC. It's much less understood externally. And it's, always, and it's worried me in the last 10 years that the Bank of England has ended up taking on much greater responsibility and de facto accountability, and not enough of that is devolved onto the but Chancellor. Yeah, but th th this is a point, official. Ed, that uh, both Norman Lamont uh, and Otmar Ising in different ways were making. I want to come back to you about, about the... David, the David, uh, David, if I, if David, I may just really ask you quickly. to pause there, there's, there's several other people I know who'd like to talk. Uh, Don, you seem to be um, wanting to say something. I know Harold wants to come in on that. And then I want to go back to Ed for the Financial Oversight Committee, but we are going to run out of time otherwise. So, Don, a few words from you, please, on that. Well, I do think that the current system, the PRA, first of all, the PRA does have external members. The PRC has external members. So it's not just a subsidiary, the Bank of England, or it is a subsidiary with outside information coming in. Uh, the second point I would make between the PRC or the PRA and the FPC is it's not just a, the information is critical. I totally agree with that, Ed. Uh, without information, we couldn't make uh, financial stability policy. But I think it's a deeper relationship than that. There's analysis, there's understanding, there's a shared goal. So having the the deputy governor who's head of the PRA on the financial policy committee is absolutely critical. And even from the start, I mean, Paul can talk to this as well, from the time of the interim financial policy committee, the person who has been the head of the PRA has helped the FPC see what's possible, how to do it, how to accomplish, has helped us get to our objectives. So it's a, it's a very uh, deep, deep relationship there. Uh, yes, it's, something, I, it's, it's very difficult to, to legislate for that, isn't it? Uh, Harold, can uh, I just bring you in there? Because I know you've got several points out of all the things that were said up to now. Uh, Harold. Thanks, David. Uh, well, one of the points I wanted to make was exactly the point that uh, Ed made very powerfully and very convincingly, that there's a kind of asymmetry between the financial stability story and the monetary stability story, and that financial stability, uh, you, you don't see what the problem is until there is a problem, and then it's often too late, and it's very, very complex. So the, the issue about um, unwinding um, big, complex financial institutions, you know, that's obviously something uh, that people were thinking about for a long, long time in central banks, um, in uh, the BIS, uh, in the IMF. Um, so, you know, right back in the 1970s, um, when the buildup of uh, the sovereign debt exposure of banks was uh, setting in, um, the BIS constantly said, we need more information. And there was always a pushback from the banks because they didn't want that to, uh, to, to occur. Um, and winding up a complex financial institution is obviously incredibly difficult. So you know, if people think about the details of it, uh, the mind just starts to go crazy. You, know, you take an example of Lehman, which is not a particularly big institution, but the bankruptcy proceedings for Lehman uh, dragged on and on and on. And so, you know, bits of Lehman uh, were only completed in terms of bankruptcy last year. Uh, it's it's incredibly complex. Um, and so I, I, I think you're almost in a perpetual world in which uh, people in the central bank uh, elsewhere are going to give warnings and they're not going to be taken all that seriously because people are going to say, well, aren't things just fine? And so one of the responses to crisis uh, 
um, whether it's 2008 or whether it's today, is that you really have an opportunity for thinking what's not fine because it's so urgent and so very, very obviously uh, apparent. Um, yes, that, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a real lesson. I, I've got several questions now from the audience which I want to try to rattle through. One might be for you, Deanne, uh, and that is whether you can give a viewpoint now from your external uh, vantage point about how well the bank is dealing with the COVID crisis, particularly the quantitative easing, which of course is multiplied now, has also gone into corporate bonds. Perhaps you could comment also on the indemnity, which several people believe uh, in this link between fiscal policy and monetary policy does rather constrain the independence of the bank, the fact that uh, there has to be this very close interconnection with the Treasury over the indemnity. Diane, over to you. Thank you, David. Uh, I think the, it's difficult for the bank to actually respond very effectively to the current crisis, it seems to me. Uh, interest rates are at the zero bound. Um, I personally think it would be a mistake if they go below zero, but it won't do much good anyway. So do lots of people at the bank, it seems. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and QE um, is not as, uh, as symmetric, as transparent, as well understood as interest rate movements are. You know, all of the things that, uh, that Ed and others have been saying are, are strengths of the Monetary Policy Committee when it deals with interest rates. I would hate to be out on these regional visits trying to explain to the business community how and why QE works and why 150 billion is better than, uh, than 100. So I think that they have done a few things which probably were appropriate, certainly taking interest rates down as far as they felt they could, I think was an appropriate move. Um, but I think I would agree with uh, a couple of the panelists in the previous session that additional QE is likely to have diminishing positive returns and certainly adds to the distortions in the system in terms of keeping... Is it monetary rate. financing? I mean, there's no reason why we can't admit it's monetary financing. Andrew Bailey doesn't seem to want to use that term. But well, Deanne and others, uh, it's not illegal in this country to have monetary financing. It's not illegal, but it's uh, it's a risk. And I think that uh, it's extremely important now that we are in this world of the Bank of England buying up large proportions of the government deficit. It's extremely important that the Bank of England be independent, be focused on inflation as a target, and that thereby improves the credibility of the government as it goes into deeper and deeper debt. But Paul, would you like to comment on that, the Bank of England and its role now? And then another question is uh, taking away the debt management side in uh, 1997. Paul, you might like to comment on that. Um, you know, was that the wise thing to do? It was seen as the quid pro quo, according to what we heard earlier. But Paul, uh, those two questions, please. I, I mean, Ian would have a view on this. At the time, I think Eddie was more bothered about the loss of debt management than he was bothered about the loss of supervision. Um, in fact, that it turned out not to matter very much because the markets area were sufficiently involved in lots of different parts of the market so that when we had to do QE, which was debt management in reverse, that kind of wasn't an operational challenge. And in fact, unlike the Fed and to the Bank of England's very great credit, the Bank of England didn't need to ask BlackRock or anyone like that to come and help it manage collateral because it could grow the expertise um, itself. And Mervyn, I must say, was tremendously supportive in, during that period, at letting me effectively pick a, a very high quality team um, to, to do that. I think on what's going on now, um, just on the narrow point about QE, something that I think would help the public debate um, and perhaps help the bank would be if they were to say, how much difference they think their recent incremental QE makes to the central outlook for um, economic activity in a couple of years' time and inflation to two to three years' um, time. And because there's, there's this, if, if QE is thought of still as a regular part of macroeconomic stimulus, then it matters a lot that if, as Dan says, it's kind of marginal effects are declining. Well, is the answer just do more and more and more? Um, it's interesting you say that because the ECB does come out with the calculations like that. Christine Lagarde brings those out at every press conference. So it's well, a good point you're making, Paul. I, I, um, and the reason it matters is because, as the bank certainly knows, actions of this kind are observationally equivalent with taking steps just to kind of keep down government um, borrowing costs. <laughs> 
during a period of, of swelling public deficits. And that doesn't mean that that's the motive, but it does, I think, um, underline the importance of being able to explain what they're doing incredibly in terms of their, um, of their mandate. I think it was a great mistake to change. It's a small thing in a way, but a great mistake to change of the, the name of the inflation report from the inflation report to the monetary policy report, because then it becomes, what would we like to use monetary policy to do now? Well, there are all sorts of things. If, you, if you're given a, if someone like me and therefore the people in the Bank of England, a credit portfolio, you can, you can use it to do all, pursue all sorts of social goals. And yes. The question is, how on earth do we know whether they're doing it um, well or badly or and who should be deciding? Bill, I, I can see a column coming on on, on that. Uh, but could I just ask Ian if you could comment on the very, a 30 second comment, Ian, uh, thanks for being with us from South Africa, on the question about taking away the debt management. That was actually quite a big issue, wasn't it, yeah, in 1997? I'd, I'd, I'd very much like to set the record straight there. Um, I, I too was in the bank on that Monday morning with Mervyn and, and Eddie. And in the session I had with Eddie, we read through the letter, the draft letter, and he said to me, they kind of they're going to take away debt management. Does that matter? And I said to him, well, I think it's stupid. Um, but if that's the price of, of um, uh, monetary independence, then absolutely we'll go along with that. Um, the debt management was a minor part of it. Monetary independence was huge. Yes. Uh, 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 Bill Keegan, well, I, I think, think you make the point in your book too about that, the prudence of Gordon Brown. Uh, you, um, Ian, sorry, you, you slowed down a bit on that, but we got your words. Bill, would you like to comment on that? Well, how big a seminal change was that? Well, well it, it, it was, but it's, it, it's interesting. It's the first time, I've known Ian for years, it's the first time I've heard that. We're always learning more. Yes. But um, I'd like to say, go back to, to Eddie. Um, I'd echo, uh, Eddie, Eddie was... Um, fascinating on uh, well it's brought up by in in the book that the bank was agonizing about entry to the erm you know, day by day and it's beautifully brought out and it, i was amused and it, it was obvious that eddie was uh, rather doubtful about all this and within yeah. days of our being in the erm eddie was muttering um uh, well we could change interest rates if we weren't in the erm and that's brought out nicely and one other thing i'd like to point out that um, as you know in in our book uh, we we covered the story that we, uh, the observer did spot that we were shadowing the ERM in um, after the um, the Louvre agreement. In, yes, in you, 18, you had lunch 18, with somebody, didn't you? As you habitually it, do. <laughs> but we had um, it was denied by um, Bernard Ingham, who was working for Mrs Thatcher. And about uh, six months ago, before COVID, um, uh, Vic, my brother Victor and I were invited to lunch by Bernard Ingham in Croydon. He's in his nineties, and he's obsessed by the relationship even now between Lawson and, and Thatcher. And he said, are you, are you sure it started then? Wasn't he shadowing it even before the Louvre Agreement? I said, as far as I know, he wasn't. Yes, uh, Mrs Thatcher was not amused. We've just got a few minutes left. Ed, Ed I want you to uh, carry on from what you were talking about before, about the Bank of England possibly doing too much and being somewhat overexposed. And uh, if I understand it rightly, the idea that you and Gordon Brown have taken up now about this oversight committee is it an attempt to put the treasury back into the driving seat or is it a an attempt to protect the bank of england from being overexposed or possibly both i'm not arguing the bank is doing too much but i do think that the reforms have <laughs> left the bank too politically overexposed um, i think that is partly about accountability it is partly about information flows i'm sure don is right about the information flows which happened between the, the, uh, the PRA and the FPC. And there's a question about coordination between the FPC and the monetary policy makers. But at the moment, what you don't have, as you had in the old, uh, under the old system, regular flows of information from the heads of the PRA, from the FPC, directly to um, the Chancellor. It's all mediated through one individual, the Governor of the Bank of England. And I think that is a reason for, for concern. Um, but then things also go the other way. If you have something complicated like financial stability, it needs to be clear 
that this is something where the treasury, the chancellor is setting, is tasking the, um, um, the Bank of England. And it, it, it kind of, it absorbs the political risk of individual decisions from the Bank of England rather than leaving it um, to its own devices, which is where I think we are at the moment. That's why I've advocated, um, because you can't have a simple inflation target. What we need is some kind of standing committee, a bit like the US FSOC, chaired by the Chancellor with the Governor and the Deputy Governors, which doesn't need to meet often in normal times, uh, once a year is fine, who sets the detailed remit for the FPC alongside the monetary uh, target, the inflation target, makes it clear this is owned by the government. In the end, the, the buck stops with the Chancellor, but also means that in more difficult times, you've already established the place where the information flows and where the committee meets to deal with a crisis chaired by the Chancellor, because that's how things have to work in but practice. We'll, 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 ask, Don, in world, we'll ask Don in a moment, where, where, would, where, where physically would that meet? Would that meet at the Treasury or would it meet in, say, the law courts halfway, halfway between? When we get back to physical meetings, where, where would you have the meeting place for this? We don't have a, um, a, a, um, a constitution where the Bank of England has a kind of separate standing. Its power flows from Parliament and the Chancellor in Parliament and the Cabinet are the people who hold that accountability. So, of course, the Bank of England, the senior guys, would come to the Treasury for the meeting. Uh, I mean, in normal times, the Chancellor also goes to, uh, to have lunch with the Governor, and that's fine. But formally, the inflation target is set by the Chancellor the MPC has given a remit to deliver that inflation target for the government reporting to Parliament. On financial stability, we need the same thing. It needs to be clear that the remit is being set by the Treasury, by the Chancellor, and the Bank of England is the agent to deliver that and to make it operationally independently the individual decisions. If not, we will end up, given the, the opaqueness of this world, suddenly, where there is a crisis, the Chancellor can say, well, you know, what are they up to? Not me, Gov. And at that moment, suddenly, that's a bigger crisis in the life of the Bank no, of well, England. Well, thank you for putting that so explicitly. You, so you, you've you, you've, you've talked about this before, I, I know, in your Harvard paper, but I think you've given a little bit of a, an extra pirouette here to uh, put that onto, onto the floor. Uh, uh, Don and Paul, uh, quick comments from you, but we're going to have to wrap up in a moment. I want to get Deanne and Bill to give last words. Uh, Don? Uh, so I, I guess I don't see the need for Ed's uh, oversight committee. Uh, the chancellor, I remind Ed that there is a treasury representative sitting in the committee meetings, in the FPC meetings all the time. So the chancellor is not dependent on the governor to convey what happened in those meetings. And there is a remit letter from the chancellor every year this year, I, I looked it up last night, anticipating this. It's 12 pages long. Now, half of those pages are boilerplate, mm -hmm. but half, half of them are specific subjects that he wants us it, to it, it, okay, concentrate well, thank you. on. Look, we, we're heading out of time in a moment. Paul, a quick 20-second uh, rejoinder. That, that remit is too long. The FPC could have lent against some of the asset price boom. I wish external members, um, well, actually, I just wish there were votes okay. in FPC. Exactly. So I think, exactly. that, I think that would exactly. enhance the debate in front of the select committee. I mean, with Hancock, I am the main architect of this. The bit that hasn't worked out at all, as I would have thought, is the debate, the accountability to the TSC doesn't work. What happens at the Monetary Policy Committee is that because there are minority votes, that actually focuses the public debate and those public um, hearings. And it had never occurred to me how important that was before. And, you know, hands up. Um, and I hope Andrew will actually kind of just make the FPC a bigger part of our public life. Good. Thank you. A very good recommendation. Deanne, uh, what do you think about all that? When a former Treasury Minister says, I want to help, uh, you, you as an ex-Bank of England, uh, you might feel a bit suspicious, but what do you say to that? I think we have enough committees and enough oversight uh, in the structure that we've got already, so I agree with Don on that. I, I, I don't see a problem in communication. Uh, I also do think, uh, just to, to uh, second uh, the point that was just made. I think that, that votes, recorded votes, individually recorded votes are absolutely critical in making sure that you do get independent uh, 
views uh, that you know you've got, you can't just go before the committee, the, the treasury committee and say, well, gee, I just went along with the, my, the majority because I knew uh, it wouldn't matter. You actually have to defend why you voted the way you did. And I think that that was an extremely important innovation. In the way Thank you. Was, uh, Bill, uh, one, one last word from you. And then perhaps you'll have a quick word from, uh, from Harold and then go over to John Orchard for the final denouement. Bill? Thank you, David. Um, for, for a start, I was very struck by the earlier of all the conversations and <clears throat> seems to me a suitable degree of humility around about how you handle all these things. But um, David Scully uh, made um, an interesting point, uh, which was controversial to some, about doing good by stealth. Well, I'd like to say that doing good by stealth has its advantages. And in the early 80s, um, the bank was very important stealthily, I think under David Walker, in um, keeping going sections of British industry that were being neglected because of the very high exchange rate and those monetarist policies. Well, well, there we are. The wheel may turn full circle. Harold, you must be gathering material for a second edition as we speak. Quick word from you, and then I'll pass over to John Orchard. Well, thank you. I'm not sure whether it's a second edition or a sequel, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I thought in terms of this discussion of where the discussion between the uh, central bank and the finance ministry or the Bank of England and the Treasury uh, should take place. Uh, one of the most crucial things, and it's, it's I think, uh, really, really borne out by the story of the financial crisis, is the uh, consequences of spillovers uh, from one country to another. And so it seems to me, if you're thinking about where that kind of liaison should take place, it should take place, of course, in the UK, but it also should take place in Basel or in Washington, in the BIS and the IMF. And uh, the, 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 the story of how the rest of the world impacts what you do and how you impact what the rest of the world do is surely a topic that can't just be left to internal domestic discussions. Good. Well, we've done our best to internationalise this, but no doubt we could get to even better. W one thought that I have right at the very end is that lots of people were claiming credit for the IT, uh, the inflation targeting. There's a German phrase, of course, which, which says that uh, success has many fathers Failure uh, is an orphan, and I guess we've we've summed that one up very well. I'd like to th be before passing over to John. I'd like to thank everybody, not just this panel, but all the panels have been incredibly innovating. I would say so. Don, Ed, Bill, Deanne, Paul, uh, Harold, thank you very much for being there as an ever present there. Uh, Harold, the the man uh, the, tied to the to the to the st steering wheel, I would say, throughout the whole of these three hours. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Over to John Orchard. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David, and thank you, everyone. Uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, three hours is a long time to spend on Zoom by anyone's standards, but uh, I think they've flown by. I particularly enjoyed um, learning what was going on behind the scenes uh, between the uh, bank's independence and the great financial crisis. Uh, we, I think we heard breaking um, news, uh, historical version from uh, Ed Balls and Paul Tucker. So thank you very much uh, for that. They've been wonderful uh, discussions. Um, the question often comes up in our discussions at the moment about how far central bank remits uh, should go, uh, and they have done today, given the proliferation of new objectives or modifications uh, of existing ones. Uh, and that contrasts, I think, with the narrow mandate uh, we were talking that the Bank of England had, wisely or not, uh, immediately after independence, or uh, the Bundesbank, um, for example. Uh, and it's been fascinating to hear today where uh, bank supervision and financial stability management should sit, um, for example. Um, I somewhat concluded from the session today that there is and uh, never will be uh, a perfect way to organise a central bank. Um, all systems seem to generate their own entropy. I think we've learned that today. Um, but I can promise you that OMFIF will continue uh, to follow uh, the merry-go-round very carefully. So uh, do uh, keep checking in with our sessions, uh, reading our coverage on this, uh, and we indeed will uh, be writing up some of what we've heard today. So thank you, panellists, for the excellent discussion. Uh, thank you to Harold for launching his book uh, with us. Uh, but most of all, thank you all uh, to listens, listeners uh, today. So have a very good evening. Uh, we're delighted you could join us today. Have a good evening. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.